cleverly, donks. Look at us now, tip to tip. This is our life. This is our passion. That's the spirit we bring to this show. I'm Luke Thomas. I'm Brian Campbell. This is Morning Combat. Oh, yeah. Oh, freaking yeah. I mean, in fact, like, oh, 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 oh yeah. Hey, how are you? It's Monday, March 4th, 2024. My name is Brian Campbell. That, uh, yeah, that double A American Alpha mm -mm, MCO, you know that one. Uh, here's what I want to say. Thank you for waiting. Uh, better late than never, but for great reason. I know you guys have been itching. I mean, just itching to get MP MK back in your face hole to uh, inject your, you know, your daily, weekly, hourly dose, MK, all day, damn near every day, coming straight off of a very important meeting. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late great great news to come uh, hopefully next week great news to come about the future of morning combat so buckle up get ready get fired up the wait will have been worth it believe me i'm brian campbell your boy bc of course one half of what we do here on morning combat luke thomas my cohort hopefully you guys checked out his weekend digest recap on his solo channel earlier today you get a little solo flavor of the old bc here uh if you will uh, if you prefer long-winded rants. But don't worry, Mikey Moore, Mile, CBS Sports, he'll have the Apollo hook ready if I linger too long in one area. But thank you for joining me here. We've been trying to populate the channel and keep things fresh and busy. What will we have this week for you on Morning Combat? We will have a BC and LT combined preview on all things UFC 299, which goes down Saturday in Miami. An absolutely loaded card, which really, really, Almost has the UFC 300 level type of hype around it. But don't forget the day before Friday, Saudi Arabia, Anthony Joshua, Francis Ngannou. We will hit you hard with a preview ahead of that. We're going to have live post content for both events. So MK back with a bang this weekend. We'll have news probably early next week regarding our future, which is so bright. If only I had a pair of sunglasses handy to talk to you. How bright the future is. What I do have handy right now during our break is this fantastic bottle of MK Jerkins, which you can get yourself. Okay. What does it smell like? You always ask a little bit, of, a little bit of shame, a little bit of straw weights. You can go over to morning combat.store, get yourself a bomber jacket, a hoodie. Tell, tell RJ Dunkel gangbanger that, uh, that we back baby. Okay. We back with a ching ching with a bang. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. A, a, a consensual transactional one. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, what a time to be alive. I hope you guys are doing well. Thanks for tuning in to last Monday's live chat. You know, we were raw. We were real. It's not been an easy winter. There's a lot of transition in, in our business in these days and times. But, you know, you, you put your nose to the grindstone. You you keep, uh, what's that transactional quality of clear eyes, clean heart, can't lose? The, yeah, yeah. Texas Forever Street. There you go. Okay, we're back. We're back, baby. We're excited. So what is today going to happen? This is BC's live chat. Let's catch up on the combat sports over the weekend. We'll look into all things uh, Ryan Garcia lately. I don't, I mean, guys, I don't, I mean, to be honest with you, what the hell's going on there? Also, uh, this Canelo PBC soap opera, which are they back? Are we back? And of course, guys, last night, yesterday afternoon, I went to the theater with my son, Chris, and we saw it. We saw Dune Deuce. We did it. We did it. Dune 2. Wow. 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 I am very bright here. I got my, you know, it's lights on blast. There's, I moved my camera set up from the other side of this small basement office to this side. I like this side better with the, but it brings in a lot more sunlight. So sorry for the glare. And I know my face looks like uh, Yanni, the Greek's teeth right now. So if you look closely, you could end up perishing like at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, but that's an old recycled joke for another time. Um, happy to be with you on this Monday morning. Because, you know, the itch has been real for me, too. This is what we do, okay? This is what I do. Every MK, damn near almost every day I sit in front of this microphone. And it's been, it's been rough sitting on the bench, waiting, itching. I know you guys have felt the same. I appreciate you reaching out and sharing that many times as well. So shout out to Average Joe Art, Jay Paquette, all of our great you know, our core folks. And there's a lot of you out there. So I appreciate checking up with all of you. Um, uh, all of you. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's get into it here. Okay. You can send in questions right now. If you can pop in that live chat 
that we have going on youtube.com slash morning combat right now push away swim the opposite direction of the racism and misogyny which unfortunately typically fills this space hit me with your questions i'll answer them at the end when i get through my introductory topics from the weekend that was and looking forward right off the top your boy bc's got to talk about ryan garcia so big fight really big fight april 20th his own pay-per-view barclay center in brooklyn yes you know what i mean well, when it's a really big pay-per-view blockbuster it's always vegas right or now it's saudi arabia sometimes once in a while it's la or or you know cowboy stadium to get a really big one inside msg or barclays it's going to get me pumped up it's going to get me fired up uh this is big in the press tour this week uh, look all in all very successful at banging that drum we've had some near fisticuffs between the two we've had a lot of viral internet moments the question now becomes this not is ryan garcia in over his head how much not just in the competitive balance of what this fight offers which Look, there was rightfully critics who said, look, right guy, we love the daring to be great attitude. We do. That's what got us that tank fight last year, which made 2023 such a special year in boxing. But it actually was better counsel from Floyd Mayweather on their mentor mentee runs to try to go after, let's say, Roly Romero first for a 140 belt to make the potential clash with Haney even bigger. And I get the history between the two which fuels a certain part of Ryan Garcia's confidence. The idea that even though Haney right now is the class at 140, even though he's firmly in the midst, in the middle of that top 10 pound for pound, if you're Ryan Garcia, you should be confident that you've met six times against this guy in the amateurs. And according to everyone, it's three and three. They've split the six matchups, albeit though, the last time they actually squared off was at age 16. But I understand that giving Ryan Garcia the confidence to say, forget about the critics, forget about the experts, all that. I know I can beat this guy. It turned out to be the fight to make right now, so let's do it. Look, that's how stars operate. And there is an element of what Ryan Garcia is doing that is old school. Oscar De La Hoya, his promoter, channeling through him, that daring to be great side. That side that says, okay, we can lose really big fights, but what are we going to do when we bounce back? Well, that narrative, that equation has been severely rocked and turned upside down by Ryan Garcia's just constant outrageous behavior. Not just at the press conferences, not just constantly on social media, but now all the viral videos that others are posting, his ex-girlfriends, his current girlfriends. He got divorced the same day his son was born earlier this year. And now in the past few weeks, he's posting multiple videos with or pictures on social media with girls he said he he would marry tomorrow, no cap, or that he just got engaged with. I don't understand it either. Then there's a rap single. Not quite Shaq and the Fushnikins, okay? Not quite uh, elite crossover territory. But that pales overall in comparison to really every hour, every day, every six, three, four, four hours. It's like, did you see the latest weird clip involving Ryan Garcia? And I get that there's a lot of people that are now saying, whether it's, members of his coaching team, those close to him, uh, that, hey, look, this is uh, this is Ryan trolling. This is Ryan getting a little bit too aggressive and trying to go, maybe, maybe going too far with it. I agree, he's going too far with it. But I think the deeper question really is, like, we can say this is trolling, and maybe some of it is. Maybe there's a large deal of it that is. And it, it would have to be, because there's so many contrasting things coming out of team Garcia lately that it's almost Tyson Fury, like of late where you're like, okay, well, he was telling like some of the truth on Tuesday, but he's definitely lying Wednesday. He was definitely lying Thursday. Friday was hit or miss, but Saturday he's telling the truth again. It's a little bit of that, but this is a bad look. And I'll tell you why. If Ryan Garcia is actively trying to pull the wool over all of our eyes to raise his stature and make this fight bigger than it is, is he succeeding? To some degree, yes. Is it a copy of the Teofimo Lopez you know, playbook ahead of that Josh Taylor fight? I think it is. But there's a major difference between Ryan Garcia's place in this fight and Teofimo's place in the Josh Taylor fight and what it means to drum up the interest using this sort of outside the wall of the, you know, outside the box negative tactic. 
Teofimo was the A-side of that fight against Josh Taylor, even though he was the fighter moving up in weight. It was his third fight at 140. At that point, he was facing the lineal champion there, the former undisputed king, four belts, and Josh Taylor. But Teofimo spent the majority of the build to that fight. While under duress from his own custody battle with his now ex-wife over the, over their young son, he amped up the craziness. You remember the sit-down video with Mark Kriegel of ESPN Top Rank. You remember the interviews. I did a wacky interview. All of us did, where we're just sort of like all writing the same piece that I wrote for CBS Sports two days before that fight. The whole idea of as good as this fight is and as great as Teofimo can be, look at the Aloma fight. Uh, is he mentally clear enough? Should he be in this fight? Now, it turned out that Teofimo got us, and he got us perfectly because he was back physically, mentally, where he needed to be for that fight. And maybe, by the way, he caught a Taylor at the right time who was coming off a long layoff of his own, the fight with Catterall where he probably should have lost and certainly looked like he got exposed. They're going to have a rematch later this year. But the difference this, in this case is Ryan Garcia is not the same ability of Teofimo. And Teofimo was the all you know the a side of that promotion the guy who if all things were equal was expected to win yes you had a lot of people even without teo's craziness going i don't know man josh taylor's big and he's experienced this might be a tough fight that's all true but when the a side who you think is going to win is now doing things purposely negative to maybe alter your perception of their own chances of winning it's still playing to the idea of selling the fight because it's, oh, am I going to watch Teofimo versus Taylor? Oh, I'm a casual fan. I'm not so sure I know about Taylor, but man, I, I know Teofimo and he's crazy. Man, I got to tune in to see this. This might be a train wreck. That's what Teofimo was selling. He was selling a potential train wreck. Only he pulled the wool up from over our eyes, went out there and systematically broke down Josh Taylor and won a, a close but clear fight that gave him essentially a second feather in his cap. He's got the Lomachenko feather. He's got, of course, all those big wins leading up to getting there. But once he got to that level and knocked out Richard Comey, he's got the Lomachenko feather. He's got the Josh Taylor feather. Well, hey, then he goes out there against Jermaine Ortiz and suddenly that flips that narrative altogether. But if Ryan Garcia is trying essentially what Teofimo did, we got issues here because what Teofimo achieved by selling us something that wasn't true about his own mental state, about where he was at in his career. It did lead to us wanting to see the fight more in a lot of ways. The problem is that this matchup against Haney already really puts Ryan at a severe disadvantage coming in. Star power wise is a great fight. You can't miss it. Like they've got their own fan bases. Haney's on the verge of really breaking out and becoming a star. And whether you love him or not, he's starting to put together a Hall of Fame resume. Like he's in the process of doing it. Okay. He's automatically going to be favored widely over Ryan Garcia. Ryan Garcia is automatically only going to really have a puncher's chance in here. Or if you will, the chance, like what I talked about earlier, he's got the confidence that he split six amateur fights with Haney, that he knows deep inside that he's got the talent that's at least in that ballpark. But now you're trying to sell that you are potentially on drugs and mentally unfit to be in this fight. How is that going to lead to people to want to see it more? If you're already on the fence between potentially buying this fight, having your friends over, doing it the legal way, or just illegally streaming it or watching it however you can, is Ryan's behavior of late, which is alarming, is that going to make you want to watch the fight less or more? Well, could you argue it's going to make you want to watch it more because let's not miss something in boxing. We tune in for the great matchups or the potential of them. We do tune into train wrecks. We do. The, the, the post Mike Tyson career after the bite, after he bid Holyfield, the whole stretch the rest of the way, which happened to be on Showtime pay-per-view, by the way. He was a pay-per-view draw for the idea as his matchmaking started to systematically get worse as he got worse. Eventually, you were tuning in to see if he would melt down. It's not like we're better than that in boxing. We sell that too, okay? You know what I mean? We also sell that. This isn't that type of matchup, though. Ryan's not coming off of four losses in five fights. He's not 35 looking to see if he can turn it back on one more time. He, for all intents and purposes, has yet to fully turn it up. So already in this matchup, a matchup I love, a matchup I want to see, maybe his crazy, bizarre you know, acting, whether it's, again, whether it's, if it's real, we got a lot of issues. If it's not real, though, and it's fake, 
I think we still got issues because I think that's only going to lead people more to say, okay, well, I'm certainly not going to pay for this fight, man. Ryan's a wreck. He's probably going to get knocked out, but I'll find a way to see it. I don't know if that's the spot you want to be in when you're a fighter trying to sell a fight. And I think even more importantly, if it's true that all of the extreme craziness that has come out of Ryan's social media accounts over the last week, or not craziness, let me take that word back. That, that's an insensitive word. Let's just say, I mean, what do you say? What do you say right now? Okay. If it's not true, he's almost playing himself because I don't know if I believe that it's all fake. I don't know if I believe that it's all a ruse. If you watch the interviews closely, this is a completely different person than the guy a year ago leading up to the Tank Davis fight. Look, him and Tank Davis sold the crap out of that fight. In, a, in the modern streaming era, illegal streaming era, that did a legit like 1.2 million pay-per-view buys, which is ridiculous nowadays. Ridic you can argue that Pacquiao and Mayweather broke the pay-per-view model. Or, or Connor and Floyd, you know, two years later, broke the pay-per-view model because it was two fights that were just so successful. And in some cases, didn't live up to the full expectation that maybe it broke the model. Well, illegal streaming broke the model too. That fight reactivated the model. I do think you're going to get, you know, Ryan Garcia told me in my interview that you can catch on youtube.com slash morning combat. It was a rough interview, by the way. He, he openly offered up front, I don't have a lot left. That's a long day of interviews. I, I, I don't have good answers for you. Well, he didn't. He, he avoided or sidestepped most of the questions, even the heavy-handed ones that I purposely tried to throw to get a response I can use, to get a response that people would care about. He did give me a little nugget on the Canelo as he ducking Benavidez one. The rest of it was kind of like a mail-in job. If he is... Uh, if this, if if he's trying to sell that this is all fake, I, I I'm I'm scared for him that he's playing himself, because that would be a very very aggressive sell job, and the messages that have come out of there are so contrasting that it's hard to tell. I mean, if he is clean, as he would say, I mean the fact that he had to come out to a press conference and say, as a leading topic, guys, I've heard the rumors. I just want you all to know I'm not on cocaine. Okay, but I am on some of that weed and that drank and who else out there isn't okay. I get, I get that mindset. It's the same mindset when Julio Cesar Chavez jr. Got popped for weed and he got suspended. This was, you know, seven, eight years ago. It was in a more dinosaur time in terms of how we looked at marijuana and its connection to everyday life and, and it's combat sports too. That Bob Arum in the interviews afterwards, he was juniors promoter at that point said, Hey, look, it's easy for all you guys to say, what is he doing? He's an idiot. But I bet every single one in this room got high themselves in the past weeks or months. And that's true, especially now. But we're not professional athletes with huge question marks. Did Ryan Garcia bounce back from the really bad tank loss? Really bad. You know, got dropped, maybe reactivated an, in an injury to his rib, but essentially was willing to wait out the 10 count on one knee, right? Not a great look in a really big fight. Did he come back and beat Oscar Duarte in between? Yes, he did. Didn't look, didn't look great though. All right, experimenting with a weird shoulder roll that's coming from the Floyd Mayweather uh, relationship that, I mean, Andre Berto tried that in the first Robert Guerrero fight, nearly went blind. You remember the memes, right? The two closed eyes. I mean, not everybody can pull that off. So here's already a guy with a lot of question marks of the idea of will his game ever equal up to the large amount of marketable future that he has, the, the connection with his audience through social media, the you know 9 million Instagram followers or whatever he has that we've been rightfully bragging about for years. We have really haven't had a, a self-made star like this who, who has built his own audience separate from his own sport in a long time. But that man has a lot of questions over whether he'll ever be of the elite ilk which is why it probably would have been smarter in the larger term business-wise to go after a belt against somebody a little more limited and raw, somebody like a Rolly Romero, and build toward this fight. He didn't want to do that. But if you have to come out in a press conference and say, I'm not on Coke, but don't worry, guys, I'm just drinking that thing and I'm smoking like crazy, but so do you. We're not fighters with big question marks going into the biggest fight of our career in which we're automatically going to be a huge underdog to begin with. And even if this is Ryan saying, screw it, I want them all to think I don't have it. I want to shock everyone, including Devin. That would be one thing. But he's gone so aggressive, if this is true, that this is just a ruse, 
that I think he's playing himself, that it would be hard for this all to be fake. Some of this has to be real. And if you're outwardly telling people as a potential young role model that, you know, I'm this boxing star, but I can get down and get turned up too. And so could you. You can't. It's not a good message to say. All right. That's why Devin Haney called him out afterwards. And yeah, there was a regrettable press conference moment with Garcia's dad talking about nappy hair that led to some racism. And that wasn't cool either. But, but, uh, these are bad warning signs for Ryan Garcia in a big way. In a big way. I already did not like his chances in this fight. I now like them a lot less. A lot less. You don't mess with a fighter like Devin Haney. And if you do, you better have a huge chin and a huge punch to be able to try to walk him down late and surprise him. I know that Ryan Garcia has next level hand speed. I know that as an amateur, he was lightning quick. And, you know, he probably did give a 14, 15, 16 year old Haney some pause, something to think about back then. But who they are in the last 10 years, 11 years since that fight, the gap has widened. And I'm just not seeing Ryan Garcia even entering this, this next chapter with, uh, with trainer Derek James. I'm still not seeing the improvements to the areas which, which he's not just vulnerable. He's potentially catastrophically vulnerable, right? The backing up with his chin up and, and deer in the headlights look. The, look, there's a lot of parts of his game that were offensively flashy, great, dangerous, but doesn't have it all buttoned up. And to try to sit here and, and accept that this is all just trolling, that's hard to do. That's really hard to do. Because even if you could show me proof it's all this trust trolling, I'm still telling you this guy has an uphill battle of even being competitive in this fight after the first couple of rounds. That's who Haney is, a surgical commander of distance. A guy who, I know that people don't like him, and I know that he's going overboard to be the straight baby face now almost in opposition to this Ryan Garcia, like, what is he going to say next thing? And he's doing, to a certain degree, he's doing a decent job at that. But I know that people don't love Haney's personality. But you better understand exactly who he is. And that's one of the best boxers in this game who would already whoop up most likely on Ryan Garcia, even though we're happy. We're happy to have this fight made. We're happy to have young stars go out of their way to do this. And that's where you got to give Ryan credit again. And also Haney, who is basically made a decision that he's not going to wait till the end of his career to try to achieve that sort of Canelo validity where, where look, I'm such a big star that I'm a network and, and promotional free agent whenever I want to be sure. I'll sign with you for two fights, but then I'm going to hop to this network. What, Can what Canelo is doing right now, which is really the blueprint that Miguel Cotto was doing about six, seven years ago at the end of his career. It's incredibly hard to achieve because you've got to be, You've got to have such sustainability at the highest level, but you've got to be a legit star. Haney has inverted that model. He was the guy who, instead of going to the amateur route, was like, no, my dad's going to take me down to Mexico and we're going to turn pro as a teenager and fight guys in bars just to get that real experience. And it's interesting, by the way, that Floyd Mayweather's jumping into the camp of Ryan Garcia, even if it's just for that mentor role of going running with him in Las Vegas and trying to impart some necessary discipline into him or, or, or thought process. A lot of people think, well, that's weird because Ryan's promoted by Oscar De La Hoya, who's a big rival and longtime enemy of Floyd. But you've got to look a little bit deeper, in my opinion, to try to find the reasons why. And I think it came out when Devin Haney put out that tweet a couple of days ago saying, look, Floyd's been a hater of me my whole life and I've kept it quiet. For those that don't know, Haney was such a big, he, there was so much buzz when he was about to turn pro. Like he could have gone the Olympic route, chose in sort of a bet on himself type way to, to, to do what I said, to go down to Mexico as a teenager and build that way. But even from the beginning, him and his dad, Bill Haney, manager, trainer, father, is he a pimp? I don't know, but that's been a part of the big storyline in this as well. Um, they were so strategic in who they're going to sign with and who not to, but don't be fooled. They had their pick of promoters when he was about to turn pro. And everybody put their arm around him and said, I'm, you know, I'm going to make you, you're going to be my guy, including Floyd Mayweather. And I think it was Haney saying, I'm going to operate in this space in Las Vegas, but I don't need to necessarily be under your shadow like Tank was. I think that rubbed Floyd the wrong way. I think that's why he went out of his way to say, oh, Ryan's probably going to end up fighting this guy. Let me put my arm around him. Not just because I don't like Haney, but also because I promote Roley, who they all wanted Ryan to face. So you can see where that's all happening. But even Haney's like, damn, Floyd, a hater. 
Haney still fought through and persevered and is in such an advantageous position right now in his career because of those super smart moves. But he never would have been able to pull that off like Floyd if he didn't have the ability. He's got the ability in spades to do really bad things to Ryan Garcia. So this whole acting up thing to, in theory, gain attention, I think it's failing miserably. I think it's not only getting more negative eyeballs on Ryan, not in the way that produces clicks, but in the way that's only going to produce more questions. It's obvious to me that things are topsy-turvy in Ryan Garcia's world. You can hear it sneak out when he talks at length and says, you guys don't know what it's like to be 25 years old, 27 years old with all this money. I mean, now he's calling himself like a billionaire. I don't, I'm not trying to be a hater here, but when the haters come out and say, hold, hold on, Ryan, you, you had one big fight and you did, you had one big fight against Tank. Rumors that you made upwards of 30 million afterwards. And that's great. I know he's telling everybody he made a hundred million or now he's a billionaire. He's saying a lot of weird things lately. Okay. I'm not going to get on him in his personal life, baby mamas and kids. I mean, look, that's, it's his business. It, it, and he's right on one thing. If I was at his age with his money, I'd be doing a lot of ridiculous things. But at some point, it's got to feel like he's pulling that all back together and getting in and focused. And I don't think I've seen that. I don't think any of his trainers have seen that. I mean, Joe Goosen tiptoed around the way Ryan fired him after the tank fight and didn't bash him right away. It was a professional move by Joe. Joe knows the, the score there. You know what I mean? But it was obvious, you know, and if you go back and watch the interviews that we did on Morning Combat with Joe Goosen at the presser ahead of that fight, you can hear in his words, Ryan doesn't listen all the way. He runs his own show. Yeah, that's to a fault. We all thought his soap opera with Oscar De La Hoya up to this point has all been Oscar's fault because Oscar is crazy. Oscar's all over the place. He makes very poor decisions, but is able to pull himself back in and pull off a big fight. Oscar was great in the Tank versus Ryan build. He played the villain perfectly to drum up more attention here. But I'm wondering now if Ryan's just a handful to deal with. And that's been part of Oscar's mindset. Maybe Oscar is thinking... Let's just make this fight while we can. Let's cash him out if this is going to be the if this is going to be the last truly big fight in which people are giving him a chance, which is not unrealistic if he goes in there and loses and loses in a one-sided fashion to Haney. I know he's young, but until we see monster market improvement, it, it, it's hard to believe in this guy. And now he's giving us extra reason purposefully to not believe in him. It's a lot of weird stuff. Weird stuff going on behind the scenes. And and I I, I cheer for him, Ryan. You know, I, I I appreciate the mental health battles he's had. I appreciate his, what seems to be a deeper connection with his faith in Jesus Christ. But the way he's even throwing that out and then doing wacky behavior along with it, it's it's been it's been uh, it's been nerve wracking. I don't think he should be pulled from the fight, but I think those that are in power, those that have influence uh, need to really sit him down and, and be like, Let's turn the Twitter off for a while. Let's turn the X, the the IG, the Snapchat. Let's turn them all off for a while. Let's get back to business and let's prepare defensively to be in this fight for the long haul. I wish him the best, but uh, this is rough. This is very, very rough. Mikey, did you have a question from the fans there about Raga you wanted to load up before I transition out of here? I, sometimes I get caught up in the, uh, in the, in the, all right. Yeah, I, I get down with the, uh, yeah, it's about cashing himself out. Um. That's an interesting question. The idea of is Ryan rushing toward this fight because he is also cashing himself out. Maybe he is looking long-term and saying, look, I'm a good looking guy. I'm trying to get into music. I'm in, I'm in an influencer. I'm all these things. I'm a model. Do I really want to be about this in the long run? I think his call out of Jake Paul, if that's what you want to call it. Although Ryan fights at 140 and Jake Paul's a cruiserweight. Um, I think that that shows you something about Ryan. It feels like he is an, a boxer who has two feet in the influencing game who would rather just be an influencer and take seemingly not important fights and, and, and do big stuff. Now, it's hard for me to say when he's running after Tank and now running after Haney, you don't see any influencers in between, right? No, but it, you're just starting to get that feeling like maybe Ryan is cashing himself out of elite boxing right now and maybe he knows it. And maybe that's why there's all this crazy behavior. It's interesting to think about. I hope not. I hope he stays in this game for a while, but there's a reason why we had Amir Khan comparisons there.
They're both incredibly flashy offensive fighters that are super elite in one category who carry themselves like stars. And what can you say negatively about Khan? Well, his chin, first of all, but you can always say the guy always got himself back up and tried to make another big fight in a lot of ways to his detriment. I don't think Ryan's going to be in it for that long run. I wonder if that's true. That question about him cashing himself out too. How could you not have this, this, these reactions that I'm having now after everything he did this week, it was, it was wacky. It was wild. Um, how about less time talking about Ryan Garcia um, about Jake Paul and more time talking about Haney, more time talking about who you would fight if you beat him. I just get that weird feeling that, uh, if Ryan loses this disastrously, yeah, we'll see him again. But will we really see him again? Will we see that guy who had that motivation ahead of the tank fight, who had that focus? Maybe you didn't believe everything Ryan said ahead of the tank fight, but I think he sold the idea that with that unbeaten record, with the knowledge of how good he can be offensively, he believed he had a chance to win that. And he sold that belief. And I think the public bought it. I don't know if I have that belief in him or for him in this Haney fight. And that's that's difficult when you add in all the behavior of what he's doing. Let's get to topic number two here. I did it uh I did it last night, Dune 2. Shout out the director, Denis Villeneuve, my uh my French Canadian brother in there. <clears throat> Shout out to my son Chris, who who was willing to go with me and endure three hours in the theater. I chose against IMAX, even though I love it, because you've heard my debate about the non-comfortable chairs. And if you're gonna commit to a three-hour movie and potentially be edge of your seat and dialed in. You better take comfort seriously. So I took a regular theater recliner chair, but I added the Dolby surround thing. And that was really key because if you're going to see Dune 1 or 2, and I'm not talking about the 1984 David Chase version, or is that the guy's name? with Chase, Whatever the guy's name is, the TV guy. Um, that was an abomination. That was a joke. Everyone that was involved in that, you know, essentially cleared their name from the project. But if you're going to watch the first Dune, which came out in 2021, or this Dune 2, Essentially, the storylines of both make up the first book from Frank Herbert, the, the original Doom book, 1965, the one that George Lucas stole every idea for Star Wars from and every other movie, science fiction movies essentially stole from this. Then you need to see it in the theater. And if you can, now I would have loved IMAX with the 3D glasses, with every other thing laying down. I mean, shake I would love the whole thing, right? I'm ready to get in. I'm ready to go in full Matrix on it. Put, put, put the put the the weird Zuck mask on. Put let me put lipstick on like the glad I called that guy guy, Steve Buscemi for Billy Madison. Let me do it all. Because sitting there with the Dolby surround set up and the shaking of the seats, there are many, many moments in this second Dune film that are just next level cinematography, cinematograph graphic cinematographic cinema am i having a stroke did i just did i get any of that right there are moments of cinematography here that are that is it's a masterpiece when they're riding the sandworms through the desert and your seat is shaking and there's gunfire coming in all around you i mean you don't have to necessarily be watching this movie from the eighth row although <laughs> but um it is it is an experience. If the movie, if the theater experience, now I, you know, as a kid, I went to every big movie. Like you can't name an '80s or '90s amazing movie without me going. Saw it first night, Waterbury, Connecticut, sitting next to my cousin. Like I, you know, these are these are moments in time, and I try to give that for my kids. But from my late '20s through a couple of years ago, I just sort of tired of the movie theater experience, as a lot of us did. When you have an amazing, comfortable couch in your house with a giant big screen TV, and you can turn down all the lights, you can make your home theater even better of an experience. But your home theater, unless you have just, you know, stupidly expensive setups and speakers and system, can't recreate that magic of seeing something special that you know, especially in a kid's mind, is going to sort of like change your life. It's going to just be one of those moments. You know, when you go to AMC theaters and they have Nicole Kidman in that commercial right before they go to the thing, she's like, you come to AMC because you want to be inspired. You want to. Be... It's true. All right. This is the type of movie that 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 you need to come out of the bullpen for if you're not a regular mover goer, because you need to experience this. I'm happy I did not finish reading the book coming in. And I think uh, Web Scream, a.k.a. Christos Christophoros, uh, you know, the, the voice of Greek ways and um, uh, Italian resident. And our first fan, you know, at every diner, they've got a dollar framed on the wall, you know, like ours says Web Scream on it because he was our first super fan. He was our first donk of the year. That guy's read every book. He's been my shaman, my spirit guide through the Dune 
experience. But he told me after seeing Dune 2 in the theater, and he was right. He was like, don't finish reading the book. He goes, I'll tell you why after, you know, I'll basically tell you why, but don't finish. You need to experience this the first time without knowing. And I'm glad I did that because this was, this was as moving a movie experience as arguably I've ever endured or enjoyed. And that's like, okay, what is that? What is that up against BC? It's up against seeing Karate Kid in the theater in 1984 and giving a standing ovation with tears running down my eyes and everybody around me standing. You know what I mean? It's up there with that. It's up there in 95 when we when we all lied to our parents on the cross country team and went and saw Showgirls first run Friday night opening thing and packed the theater with people who snuck in. OK, maybe that was a weird, weird uh, story. It's up there with Star Wars Episode Seven, which, you know, you can love or hate that movie. But when it arrived, we hadn't had a Star Wars we liked since 83. Right. Because of the prequels. It came back full fan service, hit us in every orifice. I remember crying, laughing, celebrating in that movie. It was it was an adult, kid-like adult experience. Adult meaning mature, not gross and dirty. You get my point. This was up there. This is also the very rare trope of the sequel being better than the first. Yes, the first Dune movie 2021 was an epic experience, and I was lucky to see it in IMAX in Las Vegas. But as I said before, it was too long. Yeah, it was. It had a, it, it it overly served the book by Frank Herbert to to really truly present it as best as it could to tell that story. But if you appreciated the cinematography, if you loved it like I did, if you said to yourself, "I've been a Star Wars fan my whole life," I don't get down with all the nerd stuff. All right, I'm not I'm not watching Lord of the Rings with you. I'm not going to Universal Studios and riding the Harry Potter coasters. I don't care about that nerd stuff. That's not my nerd stuff. Okay. Star Wars is. And if you were born in 1978 or really any year right since then, Star Wars is, was, and always will be. But Star Wars isn't perfect. And Star Wars can be lame. And it can be over-the-top comical and cartoonish. This is my Star Wars. This is the nerd element that I am so deep into with no shame that I'm like, this is my ish. Ooh, that's my ish. That's my ish, right? Rogue One the first spin-off Star Wars movie in, in sort of the modern times, not counting the uh, Ewok Christmas special or that other weird Star Wars Christmas special that never happened. Um, that to me was a gritty production of war, space war, but war. I remember coming out of that theater, Boulder, Colorado, 2000 and uh, what was that? 16 ish, 17 ish around there saying if all of Star Wars could have been like this movie, then like this is the escalation you know what i mean i know everyone's favorite is empire strikes back my favorite in reality in the star wars series is episode four new hope but like there's i never thought there was going to be a, a, a way to recreate the feeling of let's say the first 20 times i saw star wars and new hope right like i just it just blew me away dune one in 2021 brought that back just like rogue one teased me and brought that back dune is what star wars should have been it's a man star wars man right it's not gender specific but it's beautiful aggressive harsh edgy it it, it is a you know sand and space soap opera but it's a war movie and dune 2 took it to a whole new level a whole new level cinematograph cinematographic i probably made that word up um it's a you know 15 out of 10 i mean it, it'll blow like for two hours and 45 minutes and you know i i don't have the stamina to read books <laughs> the stamina to sit for long things unless i'm really into it i was edge of my seat you know what i mean like 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 fury uh wilder one edge of your seat like oh my god, god. you know what i mean just living it it's very rare for us today to see a piece of art that transforms us to where we are in it. We are willingly in it, right? I can put on the headphones and, and play, you know, Asia by Steely Dan on my record player and start to just hear things in there that make me feel like I'm sitting next to the kick drum when they're recording it, right? I'm in it. I'm immersed in it. This is the type of art that like, I wasn't sitting there going, oh, is that realistic? How'd they shoot that? I was in it. 
so no spoilers, but if you appreciate it, anything in the star wars universe but want to see it done the best way this is it if you are a star wars fan but you're like no empire strikes back is my favorite movie well this movie which is hopefully going to be the middle part of a trilogy that denny villeneuve wants to do he wants to take the second dune book and make that into the third movie this is the best empire strikes back that's ever happened and it ends on sort of that same type of cliffhanger feel and you could be watching this, you know, doing two in the theater going, man, I just, that all reminds me of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, because George Lucas stole it all. Okay, let's be, let's, let's remember, remind us of that constantly. But this film, I mean, when was the last time a movie came out and not only lived up to my expectations? I say my because I expect everything I'm excited about to be the best thing that ever happened to me. What's wrong with that? Gets me through the day, right? Whatever gets you through your life, it's all right. Okay, it's all right. Um, this exceeded it on, it just absolutely blew me away. But there is criticism. And that's why I bring Web Scream back in here. Maybe I should get Web Scream going for a spinoff nerd bomber, complete Dune breakdown. But Web Scream said to me after, he said, look, it's better that you uh, came at it without reading the book because there were changes made to the plot, to the storyline, to, to help the film transition to this you know, third one that hopefully is coming that are unforgivable. If you are of that old school ilk, if you've read the book and you, you, you know, and I get it like uh, star Wars is my, is my nerd entry in the art world, but I even have limits there, right? I'm not going to read the books. What? No, I'm not that nerd level. I'll watch some of the spin-off cartoon series that they have, which are really good. Rebels was good, man. Um, the, the, the one that came up before that, the, uh, the Clone Wars one. I don't have the stamina to sit through it, but when I do, it's good, right? But I don't go like into the crazy, like the 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 written world and go deep into it. I'm I'm surface level to a certain degree on that. If you're of if you've read the first Dune book and you realize the classic that it is, and and that's going to be a stickler for you. I went back and I read the the plot marks that have been changed. Uh, I think that I saw I read a story online that was like 12 major ones. And there are ones in there that are that seem that do seem pretty major. Only I haven't read the book, so I can't fully get that full. Okay, they did this instead of this, but what does that mean? I don't know. I didn't read all of it. It does not affect you from a movie watching sense if you are not into it on that level. But the acting was tremendous across the board. And in Javier Bardem, is that how you say it? He plays the Stugart character, the leader of the of the subsidiary of the Fremen um, just knocked it out of the park as did pretty much everybody. Badass new villain in fade Rotha, just absolutely badass. The, I got to talk to Luke about this because this movie is um, it's up there. It's up there. My favorites of all time. It is, it is. I always make fun of people that see the same movie many times. I ended up getting dragged to the theater, I think three times for Christmas vacation, but you can say, okay, it's not a big deal. Christmas vacation is great, right? It was great each time. Yeah, it was great each time. The only time I've gone to the theater that many times willingly was Billy Madison. And if you were in high school in the nineties, you would have too. And I think I saw episode seven of Star Wars three times. And I think I saw Dune one at least two times. I think I need to see Dune two like five times in the theater. Maybe that's that. Maybe that's my overarching, overbearing nerd quality. It's worth it. It is. Um, and you know, and I'm not a. I'm not somebody who respects films on that level, or, or let's say previously didn't in terms of the art of it. But that art will kick your ass. That art will take you on a journey. That thing is. There's no. There's no slow moments. It is just a wild ride from start to finish. So, um. You know, I didn't cry or anything. I didn't get super weird, but I was emotionally moved from it. Just there's times, you know, there's when, when art can save a, a wretch like me. No, when art can, um, can, you know, make you feel like a child or that's like that feeling when you go into Disney world and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then suddenly within a half hour, you got the Mickey hat on and you're in it, man, you're in it. Get in it. Get in Dune too. Get in it. Yeah. Get in it. And if you want to sit in row eight, then <laughs> I mean, you can live it. You can be a soldier in the film, but man, what an experience, right? It'd be the same thing if I could raise up a double vinyl album and be like, listen to this right now because it could change your life. Yeah. This, this movie, uh, it is, this is something that was art. 
Okay, that was our thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's get into the uh, before we get loaded up into your questions here. Uh, quick check at the weekend that was Friday was one championship in Cutter. It was the first time really at length I got to sit and listen to uh, our old friend and colleague uh, Ray Flores, sh- uh, Sweet Baby Ray Flores, and in in. You know, I was mad when they got rid of Brent Stover, who works with CBS Sports and TV. He's a great guy. I really, really have enjoyed crossing paths with him and interviewing him. But, you know, Ray's a pro. Ray's a pro, whether it's calling boxing, Big Ten wrestling, you know, whatever. He's called everything. Um, man, he he's gelling good with Mitch Chilson there. And, and I enjoyed this show. There was a lot of craziness and weirdness that one gives you, including the weird <laughs> commercials for uh, one championship apprentice edition part two with Mikey Musumeci and uh, a couple others in, in, in Chachri. He's like, you don't have to be here. Go, you know? And, and luckily there was like 47 million people that saw that moment, at least in, in Singapore, I'm sure. Um, the whole Arjun Buhler situation with the red card, that was weird. I rewatched that fight just to see that situation. He was given yellow cards early from Herb Dean. Oh, I forgot the name of his opponent. I'll have to look that up in a second. He was an absolute hammer, the guy that was hammering him. And Dean gave Buhler that real big warning between before round three. That's like, you know, stop circling away and the crowd's booing or I'm going to I'm going to give you the red card. and You're going to be up out of here. I don't want to say that Buhler didn't give Dean reason to do it because he was not going out of his way to come forward in round three. He knew he needed the knockout. He was at least loading up with a big right hand every 10 seconds, but then the rest would be covering up, circling away. And then the crowd booing really started to raise the, the need for Herb Dean to look closely. But when they pull out that red card, man, that's got, that's about as, as uh, embarrassing and disgraceful as, as, as we get in the fight game to, to wait, to be disqualified for lack of, not only aggression or engagement, but, you know, I mean, think about the amount of warnings to yellow cards are serious warnings. Then to get a warning at the end of round two, to get a warning by his corner and an earful to come forward and to still kind of not be in it or not believe in himself enough, or I'm not sure really what happened, but what blew up and escalated that scenario was Chatri going to the, the, the press conference afterwards and basically saying that, you know, Buller is such a disgrace that, you know, even kids in India no longer look at him like a hero. That was a, that was a kind of an aggressive reach there from old Chatri. But uh, I felt bad to see that. You don't want to see that for any fighter. I mean, that's a big warning sign that something's wrong and, and you know, they potentially should step away or get out of the sport. I did wonder if there was something deeper there, a, 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 a deeper grudge or relationship to ill repair between Buller and and uh Chatri. did that fuel it because like i said Chatri was coming out guns blazing afterwards when he was talking about him so i wondered if there had been previous uh i mean look as much as we rail on ufc when you talk to john s nash or you know luke thomas or those that have done the deep research on there they'll tell you that the you know it's not like the other promotions have great contracts and certainly one's contracts are about restrictive as ever but you know that's more or less me just speculating Either way, it's a bad look for Bueller, and uh, you could you could really see Shatri being like, "Get that s out of my organization." Um, we don't even like the smell of that. Well, that's interesting. Tyra Woodley loved the smell of that, right? I mean, gotta, you know, it's like it was all right. Uh, in the main event, though, that's why that's why I tuned in for breakfast at Wimbledon, one championship on that Friday morning. How about it, Anatoly Malikin? He's the best kept secret in MMA. He's an absolute hammer. But I feel like one kind of kind of forced this historical footnote, and that's this. Uh, Malikin, of course, is the light heavyweight and full now heavyweight champion in one. He destroyed René de Ritter in their first fight in the first round. He knocked out Buhler to unify the heavyweight title. He's just an absolute hammer, just unbelievable. But to do the the unreachable the who's going to be the first three division mma champion in elite major mma i always say connor because we always thought connor would be the first one to get the chance at welterweight he probably would have if he hadn't been so inactive the last six or seven years i never wanted to happen in any kind of interim situation which is why for 300 i did not want alex Pereira to end up fighting um for the interim heavyweight strap from aspinall because i think that's that's it's a historical footnote, but you got to put another asterisk on the end of there. And I think to some degree, you do have to do that with Malikin now winning the middleweight championship in the rematch with RDR. 
because they weigh in at 205 with the hydration rules. So you basically have a dominant, dangerous, small heavyweight who could cut down to 205 and win their championship, which is no small feat, especially the way he hammers people. But even though it looks great and he looks like an incredible Hulk to have all the belts hanging all over him in various places, is that really a three division champion in the truest sense? Just like you can argue, and I have before when people are like, well, I was all conference or all state and all three sports in high school. You know, we always do that debate and you're always thinking, oh, is it like basketball, baseball and football? They're like, no, it was cross country, indoor track and outdoor track all running the same distance. And it's like, okay, well, that's not, it's not that that's not impressive. I mean, my kids are in track, indoor track and outdoor track. I've become a track dad. It's great, right? A running dad. I was a cross country runner myself briefly in high school and loved it. But that's the same sport, all three seasons, basically the same thing. I mean, that's kind of what, there's a watering down element that I don't want, I didn't want that to happen for the first time when somebody does it. And you can always argue, well, it happened in one, their talent, their roster is not overly deep, which is why they bring in other disciplines of the sport and put them on the same card. It's why their champions really tend to get pushed into champ 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 fights to get pushed into opportunities to move up or down and wait to try to get another weight cut because it, it, that's the best matchups they can they can make so they aggressively go in that direction and for the for the most part i'm not against that but when somebody does truly climb that mountain and when they do it in a way that 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 uh malikin did do it just dominant i mean he didn't get the first round destructive just powerful finish of de Ritter. He did, though, get DeRitter, forced DeRitter to quit in the middle of the fight in round three and not even necessarily under full duress in that moment, meaning DeRitter got pieced up really bad at the end of round two, which started to show you that the end was near. And in round three, he ended up pulling guard, was trying to entrap Anatoly Malikin. Malikin landed some ground and pound from a standing bent over position. And then eventually he just stood up and was like, come on, get up. And RDR didn't get up. And Herb Dean had to sort of go, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, you're done. You're done. And rightfully so. And I'm not here to bag on RDR. I mean, he came in there with a with a different renewed strategy and vigor. Still under the auspices, though. And you, if you heard my interview with him in Morning Combat, he said it, of the idea of if I get one takedown on this guy, I think I'm going to end the fight. So even though Rene Derrida worked on his striking like crazy ahead of that rematch, and it showed to a small degree, I mean, that highlight he had in round one of being of landing that stiff jab and mixing it up instantly with a kick to the to the side of the leg that dropped Malikin. I mean, that was great. But that was the only moment or or strike of of significance against Malikin because Malikin's takedown defense was light out across the board. And if you can't hurt a guy like that who's got a really good gas tank and obviously just has clubbing power with both hands and knows how to get it off too, right? Knows how to land it cleanly. You're not going to slow him down at all. So the equalizer was going to be the ground game, but man, when RDR couldn't even touch him in terms of trying to take him down, it did feel inevitable. Those punches, I mean, Malik is basically squaring up at the end of round two, just landing left and right. This guy's a beast, meaning... You want it to be somebody like Malikin that does something on that level. Three division champion all at once, simultaneous. I mean, that's ri it's ridiculous enough if somebody like Frankie Edgar, who who did it at one division of lightweight, right, was a, I think it was a two time title challenger at featherweight, and of course tried his best at bantamweight to to climb the rankings. If someone like that did it, but over separate times and eras in their career, you go, okay, wow, an incredible longevity, consistent, just just, just a great athlete. But to do it at the same time means you're a, you're a killer. I mean, you're an absolute star. And that's what he is. And I don't take anything away from his performance. Now, matchmaking is obviously really tough. He had to cut down to middleweight, but really it's 205. But he had to still prove that he can do that. But to walk around with three belts and call him a three-division champion when he's winning middleweight championship fights at 205, that's it's really two divisions, right? You know, I mean, you can make the indoor track comparison or you can even make the comparison where people tried to downgrade Amanda Nunes in the UFC. And I wasn't one of those people. I think she's an absolutely legitimate, not only greatest female fighter of all time, but two division champion. But you can certainly argue and say, okay, but like, what's the validity of the 145 belt? I think in her case, you can't say that because the validity of the 45 belt, the validity was to have a championship that Chris Cyborg can win which she did. And the only way Amanda Nunes was going to win that belt was to go through her at that time, which she did. So in that sense, I give her that, but it's almost like that can almost have an asterisk on it of how much depth is there really at 145. Well, that, you know, 
at one when you can play with the scales like that. Um, yeah. You know, I do want to watch the uh, Chatri season two of The Apprentice. I wish I could like convince Luke that we should do like a live companion to it and just make fun of it the whole time. It would be something. I mean, there is just this preposterous sense of self like grandizing in Chatri that is almost um, it's it's humorous, but it's almost commendable in a way too. you're like, damn, man, you've got a lot of a lot of confidence there. OK, keep keep rolling with it. But I do like the card. I love, again, that one championship puts the belt right outside the cage for title fights. There's a lot of the elements to that show that that I think they're improving on. I'm excited for them to come to the U.S. And like we've always said, hopefully they can do, uh, hopefully they can continue recruiting on a level that brings in more recognized names and, and can really uh, can really do that. But um, yeah, I made that, Mikey, reaching out about those Shatri comments about Buller not being a hero anymore. I mean, just, un, just unbelievable. Quickly on the UFC, uh, this this fight card stunk on paper. It was it probably played out a little better. Uh, I know John Anik was there, and then, you know, some people were like, man, that proves that it's, you know, even John Anik's in the apex. But maybe John Anik was scheduled well in advance because this was supposed to be the Saudi Arabia card. And if it was really this card, I know that Dana said it's an absolute bullface lie if anyone suggests that. Uh, Saudi Arabia or Turkey, Al Sheikh turned down the initial fight night offering because, as Dana said, we never offered a fight card to them. That might be true, but we've learned on this show you got to take everything Dana White says with a grain of salt. You can put the same asterisk on him every time he talks because that's just where we're at with him. I mean, prove me wrong in that regard. Um, but it was good to hear Anik on there. They got to get out of that apex, though, and they have to not put cards together like this. It wasn't that the card was like, next level awful okay it kind of was you did have fights up and down the car that you kind of needed to see which you could almost argue like should that have been should umar and Nurmagomedov have been the main event over the heavyweights there well it's a much more interesting story and that's probably your biggest potential breakout player on the card so yeah and you got the name you know the last name like it, it probably should have but they put the largest weight on there in the main event they put a heavyweight fight between rosenstruck and gassiev that um yeah yeah. All right. So uh, what do we learn from this quickly? The big the big headline, Umar Nurmagomedov is that guy. Damn, he's that guy. And he got rocked and dropped early. And he took on the uh, guy who was making his UFC debut, Bekzat Almakin. Almakan? Almakan? How am I supposed to say that right? From Kazakhstan, I believe the guy looked fantastic. I mean, was a striking dynamo. I mean, to be able to drop Umar like that. But the ease that Umar went from dropped and potentially hurt to reversing top position, ground and pound. And basically the next 23 minutes, we're going to be doing exactly just that. It was Nurmagomedov like, Habib like, right? I mean, it was, I mean, Habib was arguably one calf strike away from peril against Justin Gage. I mean, you know, maybe, I mean, it looked like it from my, my vantage point. And what did he do? He instantly took advantage and spun the situation around in his favor. And then there was the quick tap out. And there we are. And that's what the greats can do. Umar Nurmagomedov, even through, what is it, six or seven fights up to this point in the UFC, all victories. I believe he's 6-0 and with four stoppages, I believe. Um, he has not yet fought that, that extreme step up. I mean, he's still ranked only 13th or 12th coming in. But you know what you see in him. You see the goods. He's the brother of Usman Nurmagomedov, the Bellator champion uh, or former one. And uh, of course, had his own drug test issue and there's a fallout from that. But you know the quality there in that family, in, Umar, in, in Umar's brother Usman and now what Umar is showing in the UFC. I mean, I would have, if there's any criticism, like I would have liked to have seen him stand more in that fight knowing that his opponent was dangerous with the hands only because I, look, if when you watch performances like this from Umar, yeah, he got dropped early, but he dominated to like a 30 to 25 level on the scorecards the rest of the way. Like absolutely dominated, bloodied, just controlled and, and was offensive the whole time. But when you're doing that, you're like, okay, enough of this fooling around between 10 and 15. Let's get this guy a real fight. Let's put him in the title picture. Well, you're going to need him to see him to stand up against killer strikers. So I get the strategy and the turn and, and Coach Javier Mendez telling him in the corner, okay, let's not strike anymore. Let's win this fight with your strength. I get the efficiency in that to say, well, this is my plan A and I'm so good at it. And if I can beat you at it without taking punishment, why should I, you know? Yeah. I mean, Habib to a certain degree was like that for a lot of the way too, until he couldn't. And to his credit, he was able to turn what first looked like a rudimentary striking skill set into something that perfectly set up his dominance on the ground and was, you know, more than adequate for him. 
I want to see that come out of Umar now, right? And we've certainly seen offensive flashes from him up, up in this way. But when he can do that to his opponents too, obviously you equally respect how he was able to take that fight from a bad moment and then shut it down. Yeah, that's the story coming out of that card. His future, how quickly we can get him into legitimate matchups in this division, which is still, for my money, the deepest in the entire sport and most exciting. That was a great performance there against Bakzat Almakan, who I also would like to see more of. Um, a couple people retire on this card too. I'm not here to talk about Javid Basharat. I'm sure Luke Thomas did a lot earlier, but uh, I did want to shout out though, Steve Ursag from Australia at Flyweight. That knockout of Matt Schnell in round two was brutal. To see him put these two performances together, this is somebody to watch out for. Also on this card in the same division, I think it was Mohamed Mokayev's moment against former title challenger Alex Perez to hopefully, for his sake, say the same thing. I don't think he did. Now, he got the win, and he was able to be solid leaning on his A-game of, of grappling to do that, but it was unspectacular. I think long-term, he'll be just fine. He's so young at 23. The people that want him to be a killer now, can you pick apart to some degree? You could. He's also fighting a very tough opponent. But I think this is a lot more than survive in advance. I think Mokayev is showing you who he can be. Maybe he's not as well-rounded or as flashy as you would want him to be for time, for compared to how he's looked at different times. But he's solid, just the same. Gets the victory there. It's now going to be interesting. With Pantoja, the champion, needing an opponent, presumably for UFC 301 in May in Brazil, knowing that that was originally going to be Hill versus Pereira, and now it's not. Who's coming out of that? If you're looking for great new fresh content, of course, you always know you can go to youtube.com slash morning combat. I got an interview with Brandon Royval that I did uh, over the weekend, about 48 minutes worth. Check it out. You know, the raw dog gets down MK style. You know, he fresh off of a big win against Brandon Moreno at UFC Mexico City. I didn't know he was that big of a boxing fan either. We went deep on that. But uh, check this out. You get shirtless raw dog Royval in a park in Denver with his dog just just talking to BC like we're two guys on the back porch drinking a beer. Great stuff there. But it's a good question. Will it hold Royval back despite scoring such a big victory over Brandon Moreno to redeem a loss, to come right back after his own title loss to Pantoja and their rematch? But would the UFC book him right back there when he's lost twice to Pantoja? Probably not. He's probably not going to get the Max Holloway look the other way on that, right? Because the fan interest was so large. Probably not. So could it be Mohamed Mukayev coming out of this win? What are you going to do with a young Steve Ursek who keeps putting big victories together? Flyweight is interesting. It's not just that anyone can win the title at any time. It's not just, hey, when is Kai Car France going to get it together and win that real big one that's going to finally put him up in that title level? But there's a few players around the board, including Amir Albazi, who had a pull out of that fight, which allowed Roy Vall in there. So it is going to be interesting. I don't think Ursek is going to get it. It's too early. But, uh, Who's going to end up getting this shot? I do want to see Manel Cop continue to climb. I know that he had a big fight that was canceled too, but um, let's see what's coming out in this division. So that was the one card. That was the UFC card over the weekend. I want to quickly mention Jake Paul because I covered this Friday night. I'm sorry, on Saturday night on uh, CBS Sports HQ afterwards. And it was a weird event from Puerto Rico, only from the sense that it it sold really well. It 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 they claimed it was a gate of 1.5 million, and that it it uh. It was the fastest selling Amanda Serrano card ever in terms of, of ticket sales and her homecoming back to her home island of Puerto Rico. Her fight didn't come off. She was going to defend her three featherweight titles against Nina Meinke. And it was weird how it happened, meaning they didn't announce it until right before the start of the main event after Jake Paul's co-main fight ended. And it looked for a second like, oh, did they know three days ago and they're just lying to us? Turns out they didn't. Amanda Serrano got her hair done on Thursday and the dye, or, or maybe it was Friday, either or the dye in her hair leaked into her eyes when she was running and onto her hands, essentially burned and, and, and injured her in all areas, including her eyesight, was originally cleared Friday by a doctor. And then Saturday it got worse and she was not cleared. That's disastrous. They had to give back the entire gate to the in, and send all the fans home happy with a uh, with a refund, which was an aggressive move, but it, it certainly will keep the fan base smiling. And they had to bring out Serrano, who cried on the mic. They brought out Tino Trinidad to try to rile up the crowd and support her. I'm not saying anyone should not support Serrano, and I'm not trying to say that this was any kind of way of her getting out of the fight. She's a warrior. She cried afterwards and said, I still would have been fighting. 
it's just it's tough, man. It's tough when you lose a main event like that. I, mean, I remember Corrales Castillo three, right? Remember when Castillo missed weight uh, again and then they canceled? Then Corrales was like, I'm done. I'm not fighting him again after he misses. And that card went on, but they I think the rest of that card went on. I, th I think it may have been it may have gone from Showtime pay-per-view down to regular Showtime. But, you know, that fight was canceled and it never happened. So it's similar in that regard. What do we learn about Jake Paul? Not much. Not much. I get what he's trying to do. He's trying to basically say that, like, there's no hot influencers at the moment that I need to fight. I've kind of run out of fighting ex uh, MMA stars because a lot of these UFC guys can't get out of their contracts. So I know I promised PFL that I'll have an MMA fight later this year, and I'm trying to get Nate Diaz it hooked in that he probably won't because it seems like Nate's uh, probably going to resign with UFC. So he's like, look, I want to be legitimate now. And I don't doubt that he does want to, to some degree, to do this. I think it is a motivator. Can he, his 10th pro fight only, can he get one step closer to being a legitimate cruiserweight title contender? You know the WBC is going to bend over backwards to rank him. They would have if he had won in his lone defeat, which came against Tommy Fury last year, by split decision in a fight in which Jake scored a final round knockdown. So certainly was in that and close. But you're not going to win. I know there was people that was like, okay, enough fighting old Woodley and old this guy and Nate Robinson, like, and even influencer one and two fight a real fighter. Does it really though, like scratch that itch when you're fighting journeyman guys like has been's and never would be's. So he fights Andre August in mid December, knocks him out spectacularly in the first round. I got nothing bad to say about that, but August had legitimate holes in his resume long layoffs was sort of in his mid 30s and going nowhere who do we have now we have ryan borland who was 35 they called him the rhino 17 and 2 could you bill it yes as the most experienced pro boxer jake paul has ever faced yeah and look i'm not damning on him this wasn't a pay-per-view it was on regular to zone i like it and it should have been but this guy the rhino I mean, he never beat anybody. He fought once in the last six years. You can look at his physique and see that he's not a serious fighter. And Jake Paul comes out, and of course he looked good. And by the way, he's looking good because he is committed to the craft. He wanted to improve his jab. His jab looked great. Quick jabs, throwing right hands to the body. And then once he cornered Borland, those looping right hands were getting through the guard, and suddenly he looked hurt. And Jake's putting on combos. Borland goes down to one knee in the corner. Luis Pabon, the referee, is like, okay, enough, enough. So it's a first-round finish. But, like, you know, he outlands the Rhino 24-3. to You can always make that argument as they do, which is, okay, this is my 10th pro fight. Find me another cruiserweight champion and show me who he was fighting in fights 8, 9, and 10. And under that, guys, yeah. This is, these are probably decent opponents. I used, you know, I used to do Showbox on Showtime and, you know, and part of my job was to do the behind the numbers, you know, when the fighters are walking into the ring and Barry Tompkins is like, and that's that guy. And let's go over to Brian Campbell for more. And I'll be like, all right, thanks, Barry. And, you know, fighter B, let's be honest, he's 10 and 0, but, and I'd give you behind the numbers of, of essentially my job was to go through the resume and try to kind of point out some truth and say, okay, look, we're very honest here. This guy's 10 and 0. But he, he's he's never beat a, someone with a winning record. He's never gone past the second round. Like, you know, we'd be honest because young fighters are matched up against crud, right? It gets you better. It gets you experience. I don't know what Jake is getting out of these guys, though. He's Is he getting highlight reels? He's getting it out of the last fight 70-something days ago against Andre August. Yes, beautiful uppercut from distance, weird punch, perfectly timed, all that. Dominated this guy. But this guy shouldn't have been in the ring, even with him. And these guys are, I mean, it's not just that these guys are going nowhere. So you're going to say, okay, well, other fighters had done the same thing. Yes. But uh, what other fighters didn't have was part of the hill that Jake's already climbed. And it is an impressive one that I don't think get, people give him credit for. Even though, yes, he's largely beat people he should have for the most part, right? Like 48-year-old Anderson Silva. Even though I predicted Anderson Silva would win because he still had some level of danger he brought in. Um like Jake's doing what he's supposed to, but I give Jake credit because yeah, he's only a 10 fight pro fighter, but he's main evented pay-per-views, you know, in front of packed houses. So that gives him a level of experience that goes deeper when compared, I think to a fighter who may have more pro experience, but if Jake's going to be blowing out these guys in one round, what is he getting? 
I think what Jake would have needed in this fight, it wouldn't have may have been the most entertaining thing, although maybe it would have with them knowing that Amanda Serrano couldn't fight in the main event. Then, you know, they did the national anthems before Jake's fight. It suddenly started to feel like a main event. And I think you can argue, even though Amanda's from Puerto Rico, even though she's a seven division champion, even though she's a future Hall of Famer and one of really the most, you know, I'm glad that Jake is now promoting her because people are finally getting to know who she is. She's like one of the greatest fighters of all time, but barely had a sort of global marketing footprint. So yeah, there was a lot of people to see her, but also a lot of people to see Jake. He's the draw. He lives in Puerto Rico full time. Like that's the draw, right? It would have been better if he had somebody that can at least push him five, six, seven rounds, right? Somebody with a with a with a fighting spirit. Okay, so these guys have more boxing experience, but all these guys he's fighting, their best thing that happened in their career was 10 years ago. And they're not active today. This isn't doing much. So when Jake gets on the microphone afterwards and goes, Hey, I want Canelo. Um, nah, brah, nah. First of all, Canelo is a cruiserweight, or you're a cruiserweight. Canelo is a super middleweight. Not like that really matters when you're doing Jake Paul matchups, but no, we're not doing that. And then to say I'm the face of boxing, no, you have successfully disrupted boxing. Yes, it's not hyperbole to 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 over to attempt to successfully state the importance of what Jake Paul has done. Even if you want to go the route of like bringing in young fans that wouldn't have watched anyway. Yeah, certainly. It, it, it was well-timed last year when boxing had this amazing year and Jake Paul had big fights in that, but it kind of all tied together that it made more boxing fans. Yeah, potentially it did. Uh, Jake takes the sport incredibly seriously. And even though sometimes he can, and so can I, sometimes he can go too far and down the lame road to try to do a stunt. He does bring attention, excitement ride it in a horse into the way in that time in Phoenix. I mean, Ryan Garcia obviously stole that idea and when he did it for the, for the presser. And that's why I think, you know, team Paul and, and disgruntled fans were like, Hey Ryan, like you seem really jealous of Jake. Stop calling Jake out. Stop taking his, his, you know, his gimmicks. I mean, Jake, he's made attention for himself, rightfully so, but you're not the face of boxing, bro. You're not going to fight Canelo. I mean, I mean, I guess unless the money was just too good. I mean, I could see like a Saudi Arabia situation, but it would only really make sense if it was a more aging Canelo because Jake's always going to have the look. Jake's not going to win a fight against Canelo under any circumstance, but Jake is always going to have in his favor if it ever did have to happen, the age and the size. So if you can add that with Canelo suddenly being 36 or 37 or 38, then it's got a bigger chance of happening. But no, it's not going to happen anytime soon. His biggest fight right now is probably still KSI, unfortunately. But if you want to go the route of, but I'm a real boxer, I think people should also realize his need to fill dates on his prospect series. He renewed for a second year. He only has that one prospect, Ashton Silve, who's good, good, good pickup. And I know he just signed that, that young Indian boxer who tried to accost him in that viral video. Maybe that leads to a fight, but he doesn't have the prospects to fill out a prospect series, which is why he's become the prospect and is fighting people that he can stay busy and keep fighting every couple of months whenever his series needs it. I'm not saying that's not a bad business idea. Him and Nikisa seem to be very smart, but let's be fair about why they're doing this. If you want to do the real boxer route, go rematch Tommy Fury and get the W, right? Even though he's barely a real boxer. Or, or start to step up to it to that next level because Jake is getting better and that's fine. But not as good as he thinks he is or not as good as he tries to present. He was in there with a bus driver. I'm sorry, Ryan Borland. Like that, that, you know, he was in there with the guy who holds the meat in the meat counter so Rocky Balboa can hit it, right? Like that's the guy, right? Okay, thank you. We have one Jake Paul question coming in from the viewers here, Mikey. What do you got for me? Has everyone finally stopped caring? Um... There was very little hype for this, but there shouldn't have been a lot because he, it was the second, the same gimmick twice in a row, right? But this was a, supposed to be about Amanda Serrano, so I give him that respect that he put her in the main event, that he brought it to Puerto Rico. So I don't think people are sick of him yet. But it's weird because the main way that he made money and got on our radars was to do the legend killer thing with the MMA stars, and that was brilliant. But he, there's there's really nobody left. There's nobody left that you're like, damn, I need to see that. And he did the Nate one and it was fun and it was a decent fight. But even that didn't feel like, like a blockbuster. Like I thought maybe it could have felt like, so I think he just needs to focus on like, what are the matchups that the fans really do want? If he wants to go the real title 
lane, then let's fight better competition. And let's get in line for that because he's too advanced to call himself a 10 fight fighter at this point. He is. I know he didn't have an amateur career, but he's, he's too advanced. He's been in situations against guys that may not have been boxers, but they have were real fighters, right? To a certain degree. I think he's advanced past that. The only time he stepped up against a real fighter, he lost. So quote, quote unquote. So I don't think the fans are sick of him, but they're going to need another aggressive hook to bring them back in my personal opinion. Let's keep the, the chat countdown going here. I think we're pretty close to getting into your, um, uh, my favorite Dorito flavor is salsa verde says Aaron Smith. What's yours, Aaron? I have not tried that flavor yet. All right. I have, as you may have noticed, um, really since mid November gone, uh, gone Spartan here. I'm preparing. I'm in training camp. I'm preparing for the return of morning combat. I'm preparing for the return of my boxing broadcasting career. I'm preparing to absolutely maximize my opportunities here on earth. Finally, I've gotten out of my own way, but in my Dorito eating prime, I respect cool ranch a lot. Maybe in like fifth grade, I would have told you it was better, but I, I don't know. Can I, can you still, is that, is that, is Dorito the one thing where I can still say you can't bet against the original all everything else. I'll take the, the evolved ridiculous pairing or adding on like goldfish was always good, but like the cheddar blast of goldfish is crack cocaine. Right. So like we can acknowledge that. I still think the regular is the, is the best cool ranch. You got to be in the mood, but it's top shelf. I don't try to mess with the, with the, with the hot ones because I don't have that, that thing, but salsa verde is intriguing because I'm a big salsa verde guy. You know, this, this gringo over here, this gringo poppy um, man, shop flipped his truck. You guys see that? Good Lord. Wow. I'm, I must've hurt. Um, Mikey, hold on that question. One second. We'll get to that. Um, I wanted to mention quickly guys, if you didn't see it, top rank had a boxing match over the weekend and it was a, uh, it was a title bout involving Raymond Ford. It was a vacant title bout and it might be the fight of the year. And it is a storybook finish. And I know oh, this heavy boxing BC and you're rambling. Yeah. That's what the BC live chat is. All right. So get it. Get, you know, <laughs> show, maybe drop out now, you know, um, so here's the deal. Raymond Ford and Adebek Kolmatov. Kolmatov. Um, I, hope I, I hope I nailed that. They had a vacant title bout that was a Rocky movie. That was the kind of finish that is just the ultimate chef's kiss in the sport. The, the equivalent of the walk-off Grand Slam home run, right? Like, like, so it's in Verona, New York. And Ford is, is not the, doesn't seem to be the bigger puncher in this matchup, at least on paper or what we thought coming in but it had to turn into that guy down the stretch. And it turns out that Raymond Ford, who scored a 12th round stoppage of Atabek Kolmatov in the closing seconds of the fight, needed two on the scorecards, needed the finish to avoid losing by split decision. And in a fight in which Raymond Ford was outlanded, close though, but outlanded 200 to 182, he rallies in the second half, turns into the bigger puncture, and with just 10 seconds to go, hurts his opponent who's staggering around the ring and just puts it on him and finishes him. And Joe Tessator of ESPN. I go back a long time with Joe Tess. He was my channel three out of Hartford, like sports guy, right? Like 20 years ago before he started on um, Friday Night Fights. And I know some people get on like the modern Joe Tess, the guy with the perfect beard who did Monday night football. Like maybe he's changed his style. Joe's always been very good with boxing. I've been critical at times, of course, with the top ranked broadcast on ESPN being too over the top, which Joe is a big part of that from the standpoint of um, just, I mean, just go into town on, on people being the best that there ever was. And it's like, don't tell me how great Tyson Fury is. Let me watch the fight and I'll tell you. You know what I mean? Like the, like if the stats speak for themselves, but don't sit here. Like don't sit here and spend an hour telling me the same thing. It sounds like a BC live chat really. Right. But Joe went from the, the most important skill that I do think a play by play man in combat sports needs. And I've, I've longed for my favorites forgiven announcers who I, who maybe don't have the full five tool set, or maybe aren't completely well-rounded. But if they can go from zero to 60 when the moment demands it, and in combat sports, that's the that's the secret sauce because the moment will demand it out of nowhere at any given point. We don't have to go nine full innings in boxing, right? We like, When it's over, it's over. And when it's over, you need somebody that can do it. Ray Flores. Ray Flores can do that. He's good in one. 
you can go zero to 60 like that and just drive and then blow your hair back, right? Joe Tess called the shit out of this to end it. So it's worth you rewatching because it's like this sneaky fight of the year and a title fight that was important to hardcores, but it wasn't, you know, on everyone's sort of like must watch radar to a certain degree. And then this fight overachieves and Raymond Ford just commandeers the moment. Joe Tess called the absolute crap out of that, providing the right fever pitch, the right just boiling over explosion that you would want. It was it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. This is like, man, when I always say like, you know, I love boxing because at its core to me, it's a reflection of life. This trope, this specific ending is so, you know, it, it compares obviously to Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. and his legend making moment against Meldrick Taylor in their first fight when he's down on the scorecards with seconds to go. And we know Richard Steele jumps in and makes the controversial stoppage, even though there's, you know, two seconds to go and Taylor is on his feet, but he's not listening to Steele because he's talking to his corner and it's just it stopped the fight. And I still think Steele is justified because I think if a referee referee should not have to, I don't think it's a referee's job in that moment to say to himself, oh, wait, there's only three seconds left and the guy on the ground might have a chance to win this, so let me just give him a chance to stand up. I think no matter where you are, the referee's most important job is to protect the health of the fighter, and if there's a moment, whether there's one second left or it's the first second of the fight, that he looks in the eyes of a fighter and isn't confident that they can properly defend themselves, then that's the call. That's the fight. I don't want instant replay. You pay that guy to be in there. That's the call. That's the fight. This had similarities to that to some degree, although without like a disputed angle to it. And obviously this fight isn't as big, but it rem it's just, you know, it's that movie thing. It's that rem it's a video game feeling like I can always come back no matter what. And, and, and that's what that's such an allure in combat sports. The idea that you can just hit this home run out of nowhere that wins the game, despite what the score had been up to that point. But to do it like that in this situation to become a world champion, man, that's almost like a star making moment. I mean, Raymond Ford's not a star after this, but you're not going to forget that. I, I was lucky enough to be a part of um, my last season on Showbox, which was the, I believe it was the 22nd. And that shows great history. It was in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It was David Stevens versus Sean Hemphill. It was just your regular, it was actually an eight round main event, which is rare, but it, I think there were super middleweights and, you know, it was two guys with good records and, you know, the, like always on Showbox, the winner's going to have a chance to propel himself closer to that dream of a world title. But David Stevens in that fight was obviously down late. And, you know, you remember in that final round on the, on the announced call being like, man, this might come down to the last punch. If he can rally here, he's probably going to need it. He's probably going to need a knockdown or a finish. And he rallies to drop Hemphill and finish him with just seconds to, I think it was 20 seconds to go in the fight. And it's mayhem in that arena. And, you know, it's one thing to watch that as a fan. It's a gift. It's just a gift, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. You don't even need to care about the fight, know the fighters. It's just, you, you understand that story. You understand that feeling, that moment. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's Daniel winning the all Valley tournament as Elizabeth shoe comes running out screaming. I mean, it's that moment, right? Um, no, how did I even get here? Where am I? That's, that's really the question, right? This is why this is called Campbell's rambles. How do we get out of this? Right. When we put ourselves down there, where, where are we right now? Um, I, but to, so it's one thing as a fan, but as an announcer, it, when I tell you it comes out of nowhere, now that fight I'm talking about on Showbox, I was lucky enough to call it. That did come out of nowhere. Kind of just like, oh, wow, he's rallying. Oh, oh, the fight's over. Oh, my God. You know, like then that's Corrales Castillo too, right? Like that's like the ultimate climb that mountain and get there. But to be on the call for that, to know of the responsibility that you have as an announcer from the, from the idea of this is a moment in time that I am tasked with potentially you know, voicing the soundtrack to in some form. And I'm the color commentator in this role, but I always took serious the idea that like, I have a responsibility here when the moment matters to live up to it. I kind of lost myself in that call. Like if you actually watch that when Stevens drops him, I actually screamed. I just screamed into the microphone and you can hear this faint. It's just like, Whoa, who's that? Is somebody in the crowd? Um, it, it, it overtakes you to be able to call fights from the ring apron. is just a, it's just a drug that that, that you got to experience to understand. I mean, it is. It is just a in that you know. I know I'll go on to call great fights in my life, but if I had to stop 
the the thing I love most in this profession, which is that I, I would tell you that was the, the most fun, the greatest moment to be able to just, and I, and I overdid it and I blobbered all over the microphone and gave this long speech, you know, after the knockout and just went nuts and, and, but the moment demanded that. And to be a part of that, you don't forget those films. When you see Raymond Ford do that in this fight, it reminded me of that. It's like, that's why we freaking watch, right? Damn. All right, Mikey, fire that question at me. I, I got that out of my system. I think it was about Oscar. Let's go from Charles Dela Cruz. BC, uh, pick one who's most likely to win Ryan Garcia against, oh, who's most likely to win of these fight matchups, he's saying. Rye Guy against Devin Haney. Francis Ngannou against Anthony Joshua or Keith one time Thurman March 30th PBC on Amazon prime pay-per-view against Tim zoo. So these are three hefty underdogs here. <laughs> Crazy that the answer turns out to be who's most likely to pull the upset here. It is Francis and It really is. It's brutal spelling on you there, uh, Charles, but um, it is Francis and It is like, I don't know. Like it, in terms of like boxing, getting back to normal and resetting itself, the result should be that Anthony Joshua easily boxes Francis from distance and makes the Fury fight look a little bit like an aberration. And then you go, okay, was that just a really, a really bad night off for Fury in a forced fight that shouldn't have happened that they rushed in there to get it finished in Riyadh season in time so that Fury can be ready for Usyk, excuse me, around the corner um, or not or not. You know, was that the worst night in Fury's career and the best moment and night in Ngannou's career? Or do we really have on our hands this, in not just this incredible human interest sports story that, you know, should, that will be a movie and that touches us in ways, you know, that, that validate being fans in this game. These are the moments that it's worth it, right? Those, those knockout moments like Raymond Ford rallying or one of these human interest stories that are just so impossible that you're like, damn, I got to be a part of this. I got to get on, on the wagon. I got to get on this journey with him. Um, even if Francis isn't this savant who can walk, you know, this combat savant who can show up on the doorstep of a gym in Paris after being detailed, detained in a, in a jail for illegally crossing the border and then being homeless and living out of his car and trying to become a heavyweight boxing champion, but then stumbles into MMA and becomes the UFC heavyweight champion of the world. That's not even counting how he got out of his deal and crawled through the Shawshank pipes to get past Cyril gone with no legs. That if that guy can walk into boxing on the first day against the greatest heavyweight of this era, and maybe a guy who at times looks like he could be top 10 all time in terms of heavyweight Tyson Fury, and he dropped him and, and kind of beat him up to some degree and had a legitimate argument on the scorecards. Although, again, I believe the judges under the scoring criteria did get it right. And Ganu was just not active enough to have a truly large enough argument per round to have won that fight. But impact, damn. Yeah, I don't know what to do with this fight on Friday. Because Ngannou really is one punch away from fighting and deserving to be fighting potentially for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world meaning like when he fought fury last fall i i spit into this microphone a million times telling you like it should have been for the title not that Ngannou deserves it but sort of like okay if you're gonna do something crazy like this is this crazier than when pete rodemacher went from winning the olympic gold medal to fighting for the championship in his pro debut against floyd patterson which you know was was like a a weird quirky event right back then i'm sure it was i'm sure it felt like that in boxing circles and probably beyond if you're going to do this and interrupt fury's schedule when he already should have been fighting Usyk, then at least make it matter should the impossible happen that was the argument and the impossible almost did happen but what do we do with that information those eight ten rounds whatever it was that we saw should joshua be able to outbox this guy yeah of course I mean, should Joshua be able to walk down and maybe hurt this guy? Well, in theory, yes. But although I'm just not sure I've ever seen Ngannou hurt under any circumstance, I'm barely even emotionally, although he took to heart some of those slights from the UFC for sure, including Dana not putting the belt around his waist after the gone fight. Never forget that decision. No one ever asked him why. Oh, I was busy in the back. You know? Yeah, I mean, no, but really, why did you not do it? Really? Um, He has the best chance of the three. 
Does the Ryan Garcia have the speed and power to land like the type of big punch that could floor Haney or, or hurt him until wherever the fight is leaning to upside down? Yes, he does. Is it likely though that he does that? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Not likely. Very possible, but probably not. Um, who was the third option? I didn't like their chances either. Mikey, re re regale me with that one more time, please. Thurman. Yeah, so here's the deal. People are counting Thurman out at an alarmingly aggressive level. I get why. He fought, he fought like, you know, twice in the past X amount of years. I mean, he does, never fights. He's never fights. Now he's moving up to 54. But he was an amateur at that weight area. And he's a better boxer still to this day than people want to accept or give him credit for. Something changed in, in Keith Thurman's career. Either, either he 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 finally got a taste of of money, of fame and money, and maybe lost the heart for the game. It's possible, or maybe his 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 chin nearly betrayed him enough to scare him into a more boxing heavy but more sustainable style. And was that fueled by what happened in the second half in his close win over Danny Garcia on CBS in Brooklyn? Also possible. But something did change along the way where Keith Thurman looked like the welterweight of the moment, with the best resume in the post Floyd and Manny era. And I do think Floyd should have fought Thurman. I actually do. I actually think Floyd should have fought Thurman. He strung him out. We're almost as bad as he strung Amir Khan out. I'm not saying Floyd's going to win either or lose either of those. Floyd's going to win those. Okay. But like he should have. Another argument another day. But Thurman changed. He got injured a few times. He got married. Like maybe he did get some of the some of the cashola and go, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't need this. Or maybe his chin did. I mean, his, he, his chin almost lost him the fight with Jose Cito Lopez, where he got hurt late and almost finished. And he almost, I mean, he got hurt against Colazo to the body, and, and that has always been a stigma against him. But outside of that, man, he's got power, he's an incredible boxer. His best performance of his entire career is actually the Manny Pacquiao loss. It's not the win over Porter, although that was very impressive in a close and great fight. I think it's the Manny Pacquiao fight. He fought great. He just got knocked down in the first round by a sneaky, beautiful punch, and he was hurt to the body late as well. I think he outpointed Pacquiao just barely. I had it that way, 151-13. So did Glenn Feldman, who lives in my town here in Connecticut. He was one of the three judges, and people got on him. I'm like, round by round, he was in that fight. You only get you only get one point for a knockdown. Anyway, he could give Tim Zhu trouble in ways we're not fully imagining. He was a big-ish welterweight. He fought at this weight in the amateurs. He does have decent pop. He he's definitely can box and is probably quicker than Zhu. But he's in his mid thirties. He's incredibly inactive, and he's had a chin against non-punchers that surprises us. So yes, it's not likely that he wins. But seeing him like a fifth, you know, seeing Zoo like a 15 to one favorite, I mean, that's just not realistic to me. Keith Thurman is the best fighter Tim Zoo's ever fought. So that's, that's a that's straight facts, homie. That is that is it right there. What version of Keith will he be here? Commensurate to that. I think that even though there's been big time away, he knows he's fighting a rugged physical puncher in a division higher. He knows everybody's counting him out. He's going to come in in incredible shape, looking to box and looking to be sharper than you may remember or realize. Not going to lead him to a victory, but I'm not going to completely crap on this fight or anything. I'm excited. I'm going to be there in Las Vegas. I'm excited for this fight. All right. There we go. And, uh, and God, I'm sorry. I have it. You know, I got to pull Ryan Garcia. I am not doing the Bugar Sugar with Coach Craig. All right, I have the itchiest, um, the uh, the um, sorry, the allergies around here just randomly pop up and it's killing me. All right, um, Jonathan Camp, what do you got for me? BC, I was a casual Oscar fan when he was fighting. Too young to be a real fight fan. How does his resume, skills, and reputation hold up today? How does he do against current guys? It's a great question. And it's, it's hard to fully, you know, this is the fight I fight because I'm an Oscar super fan. He was my favorite fighter. I didn't choose him to be that. He became that. 
I hated him at first, like a lot of people, like, oh, this pretty boy, golden boy, you know, and he, oh, he didn't get those, like, you know, I mean, there were some close calls in his early, like, pay-per-view prime, in very good fights, the, the, uh, God, the Sweet Pea Whitaker fight was a classic, and it could have gone either way, and, and, you know, it was a, kind of like a better version of Canelo versus Lara in a lot of ways, but he became my favorite fighter, the way he was able to turn that pretty boy star sort of like people wanted him to be overrated. They wanted him to get shut up by somebody and his ability to, at least in the first half of his career, at least up to the Trinidad fight, his ability to raise his game to the next level was what won me over. He was incredible. Watch the Ike Corte fight people, please watch it right now. If you like that version, that's my Oscar right there. But second of F of his career, he had substance abuse issues. He still always made the biggest fights available, but he tended to lo lose them more than not. But I thought he was robbed in the second Mosley fight in 2003. The first Mosley fight, which he lost a split decision, which he should have lost. But that fight is one of the like my top three of favorite fights of all time. It's so amazing in high speed chess and skill and speed and everything and adjustments. It's incredible. Oscar outclassed Trinidad for, you know, 10 in nine of those 12 rounds and got screwed on the scorecards. Now he doesn't get to argue that because he circled away during the championship rounds, which is a no, no, that is a no, no, even in a round by round scoring. That's a no, no. Now do I, again, do I think he got screwed on the cards? Yes. He did give him an effing boxing lesson, as he said afterwards, dejectedly walking back to the locker room with all the confetti in his face. But Oscar became, in the second half of his career, not a joke, because he would reinvent himself in big moments. When he got back on pay-per-view against Mayorga and knocked him out, made him pay for all those things he said about his wife, I was actually dancing on my couch in my apartment. It was like the, probably like one of the last times I was like a sports fan for like a team or a player or a fighter that it... It was like a, this is a major moment. Like, no, he's not dead yet. All right. He's still here. And then he got the fight with Floyd and, and with Manny too. And, and that was certainly the, the, the saddest night of his career, but who he's become as a person since then is, is tough. It's really tough. And it does seem to water down how we should remember him. He's a first ballot hall of famer as he should be. He had a hall of fame skills. He was an Olympic gold medalist. He was an absolute star. God, he won a Latin Grammy. I mean, come on. Um, he accomplished enough before throwing away key parts of his career to still deserve hall of fame. But the main reason why he deserves so slam dunk to, to be not underrated. The reason why you shouldn't call him overrated or not realize how great he was is because what he gave back to the sport with the responsibility he had on top. He always, now there are, there's very minor exceptions. And I say minor because like the, the, the calendars just didn't align, but he always tried to fight the toughest fight available against the biggest name. Did he get the benefit of the doubt in fights? He shouldn't have at times. Yes. He also got screwed. Like I said, against Trinidad and Mosley, but no way did he de defeat Felix Sturm in that middleweight fight. No, and could he have gotten up from the uh, from the Bernard Hopkins botch? Maybe, maybe he could have. Maybe one day he'll say that. I don't know. I'm not going to change my ability. He was a warrior. He he could go through fights and get knocked down and get back up. But it's his balls as a like he could have been a pretty boy and avoided people, and that could have been his reputation. But he always wanted to make millions. But he always wanted to make the biggest fights possible. He wouldn't have moved up to middleweight and fought Hopkins for all four belts if, if that wasn't the case. So Oscar is an all-time great. And when I say all-time, I mean he could have been great in any era because he is an absolutely pure, amazing boxer with elite hand speed, elite enough to be on the same level as a pound-for-pound -pound number one Shane Mosley in 2000 in a very close fight. And his left hook was an absolute money punch. Could get him out of trouble, could score big knockouts. And his him his ability, even though for all the implosions he had in the second half of his career, for for not putting his best foot forward and being able to sustain and, and be great and win some of these big fights, he like I said before about the Mayorga fight, he would remind you of that greatness and rise to the occasion when it mattered. The Vargas fight is the perfect example of that. It's two thousand three or two or three, and it's the his last great win because the Mayorga fight was a big win, but it wasn't great. And Mayorga's Mayorga. That version of Vargas on steroids, 
even even though the knockout loss to Trinidad changed Vargas, who was only what like 21 at the time. Yeah, that changed him. And so did the knockout loss in this one to De La Hoya. But all of us who grew up on Jim Lampley, what's the best Jim Lampley call? It's not actually Foreman Moore. It happened, although that's a great one. It's the long emotional call of Oscar knocking out friend, uh, knocking out Vargas, knocking him out on his feet after dropping him with just maybe the two most beautiful left hooks ever thrown. Okay, that's a hyperbole. It's not Joe Frazier against Ali in round 14 of their first fight, but it is just money. And, and, Oscar, and Jim telling that story in that moment, the way he did, the long preamble build to the stoppage, that, that, that was art. That, that was art on a microphone, especially for guys like me who ramble, right? That's the ultimate. You know, he'll tell you, he told me on this podcast a couple months ago that he knows he was too verbose. He knows it wasn't perfect that he went too far, but it was because he went too far that made it perfect. How about that? How about that? All right. So you asked me uh, how would, yeah, he, he'd be great in any era. He'd be great in any era. In fact, the argument that I've always liked to say, and because Floyd was so perfect, we have to have these arguments because Floyd went 50 and 0, we have to have these arguments of, okay, who could have? who would have been the biggest challenge for Floyd at any given time. And certainly we could do the whole four Kings thing. And, you know, I mean, Tommy Hearns is a nightmare matchup for Floyd, right? Sugar Ray Leonard is, is I, you know, I think a tough match. I think, I think he wins against Floyd. What about prime Oscar at welterweight against Floyd? What about the version of Oscar who gave, Printed out a boxing lesson and then pushed Mosley as far as you could in their first fight, which was a classic, just a classic. I don't know. 34 year old Oscar was able to crawl out a split decision loss on my wedding day to Floyd. Now, was that really a split decision? No. That was an inflated third scorecard. He lost that fight eight rounds to four cleanly. It's just that he went into the second half of the fight, even with Floyd, which very little people have a chance to do Miguel Cotto. I don't think he was even with Floyd, but I think he also won four rounds against him and was, you know, really pushed him. Maidana, obviously as well in the first fight. Castillo in the first fight, obviously probably he should have won that fight. He should have won that fight. Um, I think, I think prime welterweight Oscar does. I don't know if he beats Floyd, but he gives Floyd as tough a test as possible because the hand speed is close enough. Floyd's definitely going to lower his output and, the difference is what version of Floyd are we getting? If it's older Floyd, one punch at a time, that's different than to say, but then again, you couldn't put pretty boy Floyd against him because pretty boy Floyd fought at 130, 135. Money Mayweather fought at welterweight. That's a tough matchup for Floyd. Now, ultimately, could he discipline Oscar in the same way that he did when they actually did fight in 2007 by figuring him out, landing those perfect pot shot lead right hands or counter punches. Yes. I think he actually completely took away Oscar. Everything that Oscar did good in the first half against him when they fought in 2007, Floyd and Oscar by going to the body, by cornering him, by making it look to the judges, like he's the busier fighter. Floyd completely took that away in the second half. Part of it was 34 year old Oscar, not being able to keep up the fitness level that he did in the, in the early part of the fight. And the other part of it was, I think he was getting rocked so cleanly by lead right hands. They started to say to himself, if I keep trying to win this fight, I have the risk of getting knocked out in this fight. I think that was a real argument in, in Oscar's head. And that's nothing against his his heart or, or his backbone necessarily because he's proven over his career. But this was a, an aging model version of him in a lot of ways, weathered by the outside the ring antics. But I still think that's a very hard fight for Floyd. But the Floyd factor that you can never forget in these mythical matchups is just that. His ability to to take that snapshot and once he makes the adjustment, the entire, the, the entirety of the fight tenor changes. And the, and the only question is, have you won enough rounds before then to have a shot going into the championship ones? It's just that Floyd is also peaking in the championship rounds as you're tiring and he tends to throw more punches because he's walking you down and trying to get you out of there. As much as we give Miguel Cotto a ton of credit, especially at that age, yes, it was before his middleweight reinvention, but still at that age, we, we all felt like, man, I'm glad we're getting Floyd Miguel even though it's like four or five years too late. Like imagine if we had gotten the version of Cotto before the Margarito loaded gloves loss. Imagine if that version unbe unbeaten Cotto fights Mayweather at welterweight. It's a great matchup, but 
As much as we give Cotto credit for what he did do in 2012 when they did fight, Floyd effed him up in the second half of that fight. Floyd Miguel was lucky to not have been knocked out cold with some of those uppercuts. I mean, he was getting, getting cleaned up late, and that's the greatness of Floyd. That ability to turn it on late, keep enough of a cushion. I mean, he knew things were close in that first Maidana fight. I know it was a majority decision, but he was comfortable enough in the corner dodging the firepower to still control that fight. And then look what he did in the rematch when it was like, okay, now we're going to do it the Floyd way. And he had him chasing the whole time. Mikey, let's get into some rapid fire here to close on this, uh, this BC live chat, pancakes or waffles. I'm going to go, um, if I had to pick, I'm going to go pancakes, but both are great. And breakfast is the best takeout meal by far. And Atlanta is the best breakfast city that I've had in this country. Although Austin, Texas is also great. Does BC really have French blood? Wow. Barth Bartholomew of Maywood. Um, yes, I do. Well, I have French Canadian blood. That is like at least, uh, I always, you know, people are always like, well, did you take the DNA test? No. Then how do my wife's always like, well, how do you really know? And I always look at it like this. I have, I have, um, eight great grandparents. They're all obviously passed now. I met five of the eight. I had eight and uh, four of them were born in Quebec of French descent. So I think that makes me half French Canadian. I, I don't know. I wore a, I wore a Fleur de Lis uh, shirt at the gym this morning. Okay. Getting swole Quebecois style. Let's keep the rapid fire going here before we close. Cole Hughes, uh, BC, what's your favorite and least favorite subgenre of rock? Wow, that's an awesome question. My favorite subgenre of rock is psychedelic rock. And I don't think I really fully realized that until the last two years in this deep 60s and 70s vinyl journey that I'm on. I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I thought psychedelic rock was a little gimmicky. And great when done right or done exotic. Think the crazy world of Arthur Brown uh, record from my dad's collection that I've that I've handled. Like there's some weird ones that you're like, okay, but that's special. But then you start to realize how much psychedelic was really the groundwork of the greatest music that we've always loved from Pink Floyd to a lot of the Beatles greatest work to that great pocket of, you know, 65 to 68 or whatever, where so many of those genres were either birth or were bunched together. And then you get that sound that you have on the Rolling Stones psychedelic album between the buttons or, or the birds is notorious bird brothers, which I think is the greatest psych uh, psychedelic record of all time. Or, you know, and that's, those aren't even, the, those aren't bands that are known for being psychedelic. They're the ones that dabbled in it. When the greatest bands of those era dabble in it, you get great work, but obviously there's a whole nother sort of subgenre within that, which is the bands that are known for being psychedelic bands. Those bands are also incredible too. And I think psychedelic kind of birthed what became progressive when you mix the classical elements with it. And, and it's come back over time. I mean, that's why I love Portugal, the man so much. They're able to, you know, they, sometimes they fall into like the pop rock been but it's always psychedelically fused in merging so many different genres at once um it's great what what do i hate for subgenres i mean i have a love hate relationship with um with uh yacht rock like i certainly can get down with it i have so many yacht rock records of like you know in between doobie brothers albums or like uh boz skaggs is probably the best that there is in yacht rock i mean depends on how how much you want to over arc that but yet also a lot of ro yacht rock is sucks and it, it is from that era of corporate stadium rock where it was very much like sticks and uh air supply and uh yeah you know like I'll put on the rock, Yacht Rock channel on Sirius as one of my 18 presets and I'll get down to it to a good few of those. But sometimes it's like guilty pleasure listening. Um, you know, I don't love heavy metal, although I've loved certain heavy metal songs, bands, albums, eras. I don't I don't I, don't, I think that I, I try to stop at hard rock. I don't typically go the full heavy, although somebody who was it that was just like BC, if you're crazy, if you didn't, you know devour the first black sabbath record start to finish and truly see what an early masterpiece that was and then i took you know i, I think i only had the greatest hits back in the day so like then to go over song by song and, and hear that damn that thing is just a you know like sometimes i think led zeppelin one sometimes truth by the jeff beck group even though i don't even consider it a heavy metal record i don't think it is those two and maybe some of their early maybe like the 
fourth Deep Purple record sometimes get can get claimed as sort of the first heavy metal record, but the first Black Sabbath is to me is at least spiritually the first heavy metal record, and it's just an absolute just gem class. That some of that heavy jazz jamming they do in the second half, it's just oh man, it's incredible. Anyway, uh, we're gonna wrap just about soon. Any, anything else you got? Any got any uh, more of these brain teasers, Mikey? Uh, RM says, any under the radar fights that you are hyped for on 299? Let's talk about that right now. So we will, guys, a reminder later this week, BC and LT on the Morning Combat channel. I know it's confusing. I know Luke's got his own channel. He's doing great. We support that. Absolutely. I'm jumping in and out of this MK channel. I'm showing up on other people's shows. It's a confusing time. But on the old school MK YouTube channel, UFC 299 preview, Francis Ngannou, Anthony Joshua preview. You'll see those this week. You'll see some form of post content as well in our collective universes. Don't miss it. 299 is absolutely badass, but you're asking from the standpoint of under the radar. Let's just first and foremost say that that main card top to bottom is just as good as any five main card pay-per-view offerings ever. I don't, you know, on paper, it's it's not number one or two or three, but it's in the category. It's obviously got to deliver now in person to get up there to equal like UFC 205 or UFC 217 or whatever specifically is your favorite. Obviously, I've got so much love for 116, Brock and Shane. Those those fights were badass. Remember that that emotional Bonner win against Shashinsky, the villain in the Here Comes the Boom movie? Great stuff. 299 under the radar, though. I mean, there's a lot of them. What about no one's talking about Gamrot versus RDA? I know it's not like a front page fight, but I'm interested in the crap out of that one. Even Michelle Pereira against uh, Al Faran impersonator Mihal Olasheshek is is going to be badass and weird. Oh, God, uh, Curtis Blades Jalton Almeida matters in a big way. I, I'd love to see Jalton Almeida do do something big here. I mean, also for Blades, this will be a big win, especially against someone so hot that's moving. But Almeida needs an exciting win. He needs he needs us. He needs that skill set to scream, "Hey guys, get me in the Aspinall territory. Get me in that story. Get me in that fight." If he wins this and he wins this looking great, he probably will. Um, yeah, there's a lot to love on this card. I mean, Yan Song Yadong is dude. Gilbert Burns, Jack Dylan, Madalena. So please, when you're checking out our bonus content right now at YouTube.com/slash Morning Combat, don't miss the Gilbert Burns interview with Luke Thomas. Yeah. Top shelf. You got to check that out. Don't miss me with MVP, Michael Venom Page. Some good stuff going on in this channel, all right? I want you to realize that. Uh, Mikey, a couple quick ones to close. Let's go. Uh, Ortega's Eagle says, Luke said you will never get producer credits. BC, <laughs> how do you respond? That's fine. I don't need producer credits. I don't need control. I don't need my name first in the marquee. Uh, am, do I have an ego and can I be very selfish in certain categories? Yes, we all can. But I do look at this this game, and I always has as a team game. Yeah, I'm playing the individual game. I want to go as far as I can in broadcasting. I want to feed my kids, right? Tuki needs shoes. I want you know. I want to put the braces on my kids, give them, send them off to college, all that stuff. But I want the team to win, whether that's the broadcasting team on, whether that's the morning combat team. And I, what do I mean by winning? No, not a, not awards necessarily. Although that was really great and fun. I want people. I want. I want to be in the conversation always of what's the best show out there. What's the best podcast? What's the best combat talk show? What's the best two hours of one middle-aged dad rambling? Not a wash middle-aged dad, right? <laughs> An in shape one because of his fantastic trainer Darren Robinson. But you know, I want it to be MK. So uh, I've been in training camp. I'm ready to absolutely bring it when we restart. And that restart, guys, it's coming. It is going to be here sooner. Then later. Okay. What what was the spirit of that question, Mike? You anything else? All right, forget that. Probably forget it. Let's go on to the next one. Um, no chill 1985 says, What is the greatest MMA promotion of all time? And if you can give me first, second, and third, that's that'd be awesome. Thank you. What would I say is the greatest MMA promotion of all time? Uh, the UFC is the greatest MMA promotion of all time, both in terms of success, in terms of my fan lifetime, which began. Try, we all try to remember, like sometimes I'll say it, but it's not true. I'll be like, oh, I've been watching since UFC one. I mean, I have and I haven't, right? Like I've definitely been watching um, when when Keith Hackney got punched in the balls or when he punched Joe Son in the balls a million times. Like you have to like, I'll never forget my grandfather's reaction to that. Just never, ever forget it. It's like one of the greatest moments of all time. Like when when my guy Rafe Bartholomew and his dad were watching the uh, the brawl 
after the uh, Bo Galata fight and they're carrying Lou Duva out and they're dropping him. It's just like so crazy that you have to laugh. You know, it was like that one of those moments, but um, yeah, it's always been the UFC two. It's gotta be pride. So Mikey's sharing his own right here. Mikey's got one UFC. I agree Two pride. I agree. And I loved, I loved, loved, loved when we did the resume review on Fedor and I was forced in succession to rewatch the entire legendary run. And you see how pride, in a very Japanese wrestling sense, the way that they set up the next fight and the storyline, it's just so perfect every time. Obviously, it was filled with badass dudes and great skill rule sets and just, you know, our favorites of all time in their absolute primes, just having manly brawls and tournaments. Yeah, it was the greatest ever. But three needs to be there, and I'm glad Mikey has it. Strike Force. In my lifetime, dude, Strike Force was really fun down the stretch. I get like you can always romanticize your love for something that's gone and make it seem bigger or more important than it was in the time. But when the two things happened at once, when they had the heavyweight tournament, which for that moment, they could legitimately say we have the greatest heavyweight division in the world, better than the UFCs. They had this opportunity to make Overeem versus Fedor, which is like what we all wanted, right? They had it. And they had the video game. And it's like, who cares? No, that video game was like hot for a second. I mean, it was. You they had like submissions that you can do. Randy Couture was on that game, along with all the strike force fighters. Uh, you know, it was coming off of what Elite XC and Kimbo had done because you know, it was a handoff of the same roster, more or less. It was exciting. It reminded me of the 90s pro wrestling WCW WWE uh rivalry. It, it WWF, it really it was really fun and it was sort of over before, you know, just as it got interesting for sure when the UFC purchased them. But, you know, I remember the big nights. I had so much fun doing that strike force look back that ran on Showtime extreme during peak pandemic. When Luke Thomas and I got together with Scott Coker and Moro Ronaldo, I wish those episodes would resurface somewhere, YouTube or somewhere, because they were good. They were really good and interesting to go back and hear Coker retell the, the inside stories behind the scenes of those big nights. Like there was really big nights in MMA when they were, when they had their run there and it, you know, Ken Sham, I'm sorry, Frank Shamrock versus Nick Diaz. That was a big ass night. Like, you know, you never forget those, uh, Carano versus Cyborg. Hell yeah. I think you got to go UFC pride strike force. I'll throw Bellator at four there. I've really enjoyed I really enjoyed Bellator. I know it's not technically dead, but it's kind of dead. There were times, there were there were seasons that I've really enjoyed it as an alternative, as an addition. Oh God, I missed it. You're right, Mikey. WEC. Okay, so WEC is where I where I screwed this up. Let's go UFC one, Pride two. You know WEC's got to be three, and I'm and I wasn't a mark, but the it, the the proof is in the pudding, Floyd. Okay, it always has been. That they're just those are just. Those, I mean, they're they're in a phone booth. It's incredible. Then I got to go. Strike Force Four, Bellator Five. Um, yeah, I mean, shout out to Bodog fights. Just the same, man. It is bright in here. I mean, it is unseasonably bright in here. Uh, Mikey, do you have anything else for me? This is from Lazy Bed, Mr. Campbell. What's your dream segment for the new revamped MK? Okay, this is the last question, and I thank you, folks, for jumping in here and joining us. Um, what's my dream segment for the revamped MK? I mean, I don't want to give you a crap answer. I, I don't think it's so much about segments, but okay. My favorite segment that we, okay. I want to bring back high court. I'll say that we did it twice. It's good. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's either, if you think it's funny, it's really, it's like the documentaries, right? If you like it, you'll probably love it. And if you think I suck and my humor is bad and thus that you probably won't love that either. But, um, I'd like to do that again. RSD though, to me is the only thing that I put more important than the show itself in terms of like my enjoyment, in terms of what I believe could, could extend at any point and blow up and be like our calling card, be our thing. I want to bring that back in a big way. Um, I know Luke has, Luke and I are always like, who's our dream guest that we haven't gotten. And by the way, Craig Jones's name is coming up a lot lately because he's so freaking hilarious, but uh, I want to do that one, but in terms of like the future and the reveal, and we hope to have a big announcement early next week. Um, and you know, it's just taking time and, and, and it, it, you know, it hasn't been like things have been rocky to like some dangerous degrees. Things just take time to come together. But to me, the future of MK isn't so much about 
can we come back with the coolest segment ever that you never thought of? I hope we do. I'd like to be the one who thinks of that coolest segment ever. I just wanted us to bring us back to what the show's supposed to be. And even though I was very thankful when the pandemic hit and Jason Aaron was our producer then, and I give him a lot of credit for the things that you guys didn't see, like behind the scenes, he was smart technologically to a certain degree. I mean, he's Jay, <laughs> you know, he's Pennington James, right? But he's a really smart dude in those areas. And um, I feel like we, you know, we were in some ways ahead of the game in the pandemic becoming a Zoom show, but, you know, you can lean on that crutch for too long. And then I think we became a different show last year. Last year was really hard, 2023. I hope, by the way, that we start up soon and that we can finish that documentary to really tell you the story of last year. But last year was really hard in a lot of ways. And um, I think the show changed, not for the better. And some of that was the slow decline and eventual ending of Showtime, you know, and the, the fear that it could go away as one half of the show. And, you know, it's a big part of our budget, the connection to our studio, the you know, we're lucky and blessed to be able to, to travel so much for Showtime Boxing that we were going with the same crew that also works on Morning Combat. So it was easy to have the doc cameras out there and we were able to do these things that were like dream come trues, you know, to do these corny documentaries and to have a camera crew out with us on the road like that. I mean, it was, you know, artistically, the art, the creative side of it, it was scratching that itch and then some, it was the best thing ever. That was all great. But then, you know, as resources went away and and there was a lot of fear of the future for a lot of people's jobs, for everything, the show kind of just became more of like, okay, let's just do it and let's fill our quota and, you know, and maybe we're going through things outside the show and maybe sometimes we're not, you know, maybe sometimes we can be a little nicer to each other than we were. And, and, and it was a hard time. And I think we became something we weren't. But to me... The, the crux of what MK is, is put Luke and I in the same room. You can have fun segments. Cool. You can have a cool set behind you or not. But the magic is him and I in the same space, laughing at the same jokes, arguing about the same topics. Um, you know what I mean? Like, that's it. That's what it is. Let's do it. Let's be happy again. We're lucky. We've survived a storm in this business, right? Like the end of Showtime has been tough in a lot of ways for the show, for my career arc and path and Luke's as well, but we will survive. We have a plan. We've had a few plans, but we've had one major plan and uh, it's going to work and you're going to find out about it soon. So get excited because we are, we really are. And uh, I know it's been tough pressing pause and maybe we lose algorithms or maybe you guys started listening to other shows and you like it better than us. And that's cool. And I, and I, and I support other people out there, but when we're in a position to do our best work, I think we do the best work. So that's what I want to do. I want to keep working. And Tui, let's let's pay. Okay, that's that's all I got for you. All right, that's going to wrap it up because it's it's very self masturbatory at this point. Um, I mean, you know, we're we're selling. Look at what we're selling. Okay, this is really this is the content you're here for. Um, thank you to Mikey Mormile of CBS Sports. Thank you. Oh yeah, we should. You know. I mean, look at KevinIoli.com putting the uh, the pot, bringing the pot, making Power Slap hip again, right? You're right. Maybe we should become a Power Slap coverage unit. No, we're gonna be, we're gonna be, we're gonna be more than fine. You're gonna find out. Um, thank you to Mikey. Thank you to CBS Sports as always. Um, Luke and I will be back this week with the UFC 299 preview on this channel, the Ngannou versus uh, Joshua preview on this channel, post coverage that we'll figure out afterwards. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming along on this journey. For staying with us the last few months as it's been hit or miss on here it's all going to be for the better and it's going to be great and um i can't wait to see you there my name is brian campbell uh, i look extra pale today i actually got a little bit of color rock lobster almost yesterday you couldn't tell it with this lighting though i'll tell you that much so I'll hide any blemish well wow, bc's got the clearest skin yeah it looks like it looks like the looks like fade rotha from uh from dune 2 there we go full circle that's the end of the show I didn't talk to you about Sting's last match, but he was one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. My name is Brian Campbell. I endorse this entire message there, except for the ones that would have got me fired. See you next time.